Nice to see you all here. Thank you all very much for coming. Uh, I will welcome you to this Christmas meeting of the BAA. Uh, this is actually our second meeting of the 132nd session of the BAA. That's a lot of sessions, isn't it? Uh, I'm the president. I'm David Arditi. I was elected uh, president uh, just this year. It sounds rather grand, the title president, but in fact, in the sense in which it is used by the BAA and the other learned societies, it means the man who presides, literally. If you go back and look at what, how the title came about, the BAA had a president because it split off from the Royal Astronomical Society in 1890, and they had a president. They used that title. And if you look at why they used that title, it was because they split off from the Royal Society in 1820, because at that time, the Royal Society was felt to be dominated by biologists, and they wanted a society for astronomers. And the Royal Society had used the title president since the 1600s. So it goes back to the reign of Charles II, that title, the title that I have. And it, at that time, it didn't have any of the implication that it has now of a grand executive style leader. It just meant the member of the council who was presiding. It was equivalent to a chairman or a convener is another very equivalent term. So the president of the BAA is in office for two or three years, and they are the person who presides over the council and board of trustees and chairs the meetings and uh, hopefully ensures things go reasonably according to plan. I hope they do. One thing we have done in the past, which is a nice tradition which I'd like to reinstate, is that the president has welcomed the new members uh, so, are there any members, or even returning members, who've been out of the BAA and returned, who I can welcome today? Yeah. Yes, sir, what's your name? Matthew Rosant. Matthew Rosant. Well, in the 70s. <laughs> well, we won't shake hands because of uh, COVID regulations, but I gives me great pleasure to welcome you back to the association, and I hope you have a pleasurable time and many years of uh, interesting astronomy ahead of you. We also normally tell you what papers have been approved by the BAA Council at its last council meeting, which was just three days ago, and I will tell you uh, that uh, we approved these papers. We approved the, a paper by Mike Frost called the Reverend George Fisher, 1794 to 1873, Arctic astronomer. That's good, isn't it? Arctic astronomer, written by Mike Frost. And uh, a paper about the moon by Raffaello Lena called Volcanic Complex, northwest of Lichtenberg. I'll also tell you about our forthcoming meetings. Uh, our webinars continue to go from strength to strength. And uh, on Zoom, we have a radio astronomy lecture, radio astronomy section Christmas lecture on the subject of Jodrell Bank, the Cold War, and the space race. That sounds fascinating. That's on Friday, the 10th of December at 1915. And then on Thursday, the December the 16th at 1900, we have a webinar all about exoplanets, uh, present and future. And then our next real physical meeting will be in January, and that will be Saturday the 22nd of January at half past two in the afternoon, and that will be at Camden Irish Centre, which is a new venue, which we haven't used before, and we've had to arrange it in a, a hurry because um, uh, the Institute of Physics, uh, where we have most of our meetings, is out of action at the moment because of maintenance issues. So we're going to Camden Irish Centre, not a million miles from here, and uh, the details of that will be on the website. That's 22nd of January. One of the things that the BA, ex BA exists for is to give awards to people who've made notable contributions in the field of amateur astronomy. 
and as one of my most pleasurable duties, is to give some awards out. And we've got a record number of awards today because we haven't been able to present them for a long time. We have uh, two Stevenson Memorial Awards. Uh, the Stevenson Memorial Award is awarded to a member who has made an outstanding contribution to observational astronomy. And in 2020, it was won by Alexandra Hart. Uh, is Alexandra here? There she is. Uh, we weren't able to give it to them then, so we're going to give it to her today. Uh, the award is actually a book. I'll tell you uh, something about Alexandra. Uh, she has been a founder member and a moderator of the Solar Chat online forum. Uh, she was instrumental in a citizen science project in 2017 during the American solar eclipse, which involved creating the longest ever video recording of the solar corona from the surface of the Earth. She's also been InSight Astronomer, Astronomy Photographer of the Year, uh, Solar Section Category winner, both in 2014 and 2017. Her solar images have been featured in books and magazines, and she's also very active in public outreach and showing the sun to the public. And appropriately enough, we've got a book about solar astronomy to give her. So come up, um, Alexandra. This year, the Stevenson Award has been won by Dale Holt, who will be known to many of you. He has spoken to our meetings in the past. He is a prolific observer of the deep sky. He has submitted uh, seven, over 700 observations to the deep sky section uh, since 2007. And he has a unique method of observation, which he has developed, which is to use a video camera, sensitive camera, attached to his 500 millimeter telescope, and he feeds the signals to a monitor, and then he views those, and he makes sketches, and then he scans the sketches and reverses the, uh, the brightness to make a, a, a white on black sketch. And these, these sketches have been uh, published in our journal frequently, in the Deep Sky newsletter, also featured in Sky and Telescope. So it's a magazine. So it's a fascinating um, combination of old and new technologies he uses. And he often observes under-observed objects, unusual objects, such as the Harp and Hickson galaxy uh, for, uh, catalog objects. So uh, he didn't say what book he'd like, so we're giving him a book token. It's a bit of an unspectacular prize. But Dale, come up and receive your Stevenson Memorial Prize. Well, thanks. It, it, it was a huge surprise to get this award. Um, I really was knocked sideways. I didn't see it coming and I didn't expect it. Probably didn't think I deserved it either and there's more deserving people out there than me, but I'm very grateful. And I've been very grateful for the support I've had from the BAA, especially um, Stuart Moore and Callum Potter, who've given so much support and... Um, put up with my constant stream of um, scribbles. Um, so I, I'm just, I'm just honoured to get the award and to be here. And um, just, re just literally this weekend, have installed a 24-inch into the observatory. Um, so I'm going to proceed with exactly the same um, method as I have done with the 14 and then the 20 and now 24 and just try and get that bit deeper 
and, uh, and um, work on things that most people don't bother looking at, uh, primarily because it's too faint. So um, I'm, I'm, I'm looking forward to the future once I can get my head around how I'm going to operate a Dobsonian, large Dobsonian in the observatory rather than a, a mounted telescope. But um, yeah, I'm looking forward to it and hopefully my sketches will be coming your way very soon. Thank you, David. Well done. We also are awarding at this meeting the Sir Patrick Moore Prize. Uh, and uh, this is awarded to people who have done excellent work in popularising astronomy. And uh, this year, Council decided to award it to three people, Mary McIntyre, Howard Parkin, and Andrew Robertson. Uh, we have two of those people here today. Andrew Robertson won't be here today, but we hope he will uh, receive his award at our Nottingham summer meeting in June next year. So Mary, uh, Mary gives lots of lectures, uh, 50 lectures per year apparently on astronomy and astrophotography. Uh, she's a specialist in the history of women in astronomy, many other subjects, and she talks to University of the Third Age, WI, Carbon Scouts, uh, schools, and she's given talks uh, to visually impaired group. She does uh, tutorials on her YouTube channel, and she's been on the radio, does podcasts, outreach events even from a back garden. Uh, she writes for the Sky at Night magazine, uh, and she has uh, some social media channels about women in astronomy. And uh, she does all this in spite of mobility issues, and we, we think she's an outstanding ambassador for astronomy. So she's uh, had the money, I think, which is attached to this prize, and just remains for me to give her this certificate. Would you, are you able to come up, uh, Mary? I was also not expecting this at all. I love astronomy. I live, sleep, and breathe astronomy, and so does my husband. And being able to share that with other people who might not be astronomers currently is just something that I love doing. And the prize money is going to be invested in a portable mount so I can do more outreach and make it a bit easier when you've got a load of four-year-olds clambering to look through a telescope and you're having to constantly keep adjusting it. So. I will use that to just keep doing what I'm doing and keep sharing that passion. So thank you very much. And we have another outstanding popularizer of astronomy here today, Howard Parkin. Howard has been, since 1985, giving adult education classes on astronomy in the Isle of Man. He's a founder member of Isle of Man Astronomical Society. He's uh, talked to ministers in the Isle of Man government. That's where he lives. And uh, he was instrumental in getting dark sky status for 26 sites on the Isle of Man. He's advised the Isle of Man Postal Authority on producing astronomy-themed postage stamps. He, gives, again, gives talks to schools, scouts and brownies, uh, helps them at the Isle of Man Observatory to get their astronomy badges. He's on, he has a radio program on Radio Manx. He's obviously brought many people to the subject through, he has an enthusiasm for astronomy, which his proposer told us it crosses all ages and abilities. So, Howard, uh, please come up and receive your certificate for the Sir Patrick Moore Prize. Yes, ladies and gentlemen, it's a great pleasure to be here. And uh, like my um, worthy uh, people before me, 
Uh, it was a complete surprise to me. And it's great to be recognised by your peers. That's what I said when I, it was announced back home. Um, it's, it's great talking about astronomy to people who have always liked to hear you talk, but to be recognised by your peers was something special. And what made it even more special was Sir Patrick Moore was a great friend of ours in the Isle of Man. He helped us found the, the, the society. He helped us with our observatory. He really was a great friend. So when I learned not only I had won an award, which was prestigious and delighted to do so in, in, in any way, but uh, being awarded the Sir Patrick Moore Award was special. So thank you very much indeed. And um, it's great to be here. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you very much. Thank you. First of our distinguished speakers today is Professor Catherine Haymans. She holds the title of Astronomer Royal for Scotland. She is the 11th holder of that title, which goes back to 1834. And an interesting fact is that that title has also been held by a president of the BAA. Uh, Frank Watson Dyson was BAA president and also Astronomer Royal for Scotland. So, Catherine, you've got something to live up to there. Uh, so, the, the, the title is now honorary. It was originally the title of the Director of the Royal Observatory uh, in Edinburgh. Uh, she was appointed just this May, and she is the first woman to hold the title. Uh, she's Professor of Astrophysics at the University of Edinburgh, and director of the GCCL Institute at the Ruhr Institute, Bochum, Germany. And her speciality is observing the dark matter in the universe, testing theories of gravity. She has co-authored 200 articles in journals. She's written a popular book called The Dark Universe. And she does uh, courses uh, for the public virtually through a course called AstroTech, which has had 4,000 students worthwhile, worldwide. And uh, she goes in person to a wide range of events, including art, music, and science festivals. And uh, in recognition of her work, she was awarded in 2017 the Darwin Lectureship of the Royal Astronomical Society, and also in 2018 the Max Planck Humboldt Research Award. And today, she's going to talk to us about the mysteries of the universe. So, ladies and gentlemen, please give a warm welcome to the Astronomer Royal for Scotland, Professor Catherine Haymans. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Um, congratulations to all of those people who uh, won awards. I hope I get to meet you all afterwards because it sounds very exciting what you've been um, all getting up to. Um, and thank you very much for that very kind introduction. Um, it's a real pleasure to be here. And um, we were talking about um, the joys of the, of the pandemic and how we've been doing so many things online. This is my only my third in-person talk as Astronomer Royal for Scotland. Uh, so you'll have to forgive me if I'm a wee bit rusty in, uh, you know, actually talking to faces rather than my computer screen. Um, <laughs> anyway, uh, a greetings to everyone who is online as well. I don't know where the camera is, um, but for everyone watching from home, um, hello. Um, good, right, so um, I'm not going to tell you about my research about the dark universe, um, because uh, if you want to look at that, there are actually lots of different YouTube versions of that talk online that I've been given to different uh, astronomical societies over the last um, few months. So instead, I'm giving a new talk today um, called The Mysteries of the Multiverse. Um, what is the multiverse? Um, so this lovely picture of bubbles uh, nicely summarises it, I think. Uh, the idea is that our universe is not the only universe, that there are, in fact, multiple universes out there and uh, you can imagine them as all of these different bubbles in different places in space and time. And uh, when I first heard about this theory, I thought, well, that's absolute rubbish. <laughs> I want absolutely nothing to do with it. Um, I'm an observer. Uh, my job is to use some of the largest telescopes in the world uh, to go and observe our universe and to test theories about our universe and, and the fundamental physics that govern it. And uh, when this idea of this multiverse theory came up, I thought, well, well what, what is the point? 
uh, because I can't observe anything outside of my own universe. Uh, so really, this is a bit of a pointless theory, isn't it? If, uh, if you can't test a theory, uh, why, would, why, would, why would you even want to come up with such a theory? Um, so if I was still at that point in my life, that would probably be the end of the talk. We'd go and have a nice cup of tea. Um, but uh, <laughs> I've been thinking more, uh, more about it. Um, and the reason why I've been thinking more about this theory is it because it helps answer one of the biggest problems with my uh, current research. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to present the problem to you, and, uh, and then I'm going to uh, summarise where we're at with this theory of the multiverse. And it turns out that the punchline, uh, just in case the, uh, the nice dark mood lighting that we're in at the moment and your lunch overcomes you and you fall asleep, hopefully not, but the punchline is that we can actually test this theory from within our own universe. All right, so uh, this is uh, an absolutely iconic image um, I hope that uh, you've seen it before. This is an image of the cosmic microwave background. Um, looking around, I think almost everyone apart from one person will have had the experience of the old televisions that you used to tune in. <laughs> yeah, it's not the same anymore, isn't it? There's no challenge in life. We used to have to tune, it, tune the TV in and you get all of that fuzz on the screen. That was your television picking up the cosmic microwave background, the relic radiation that's left over everywhere in our universe from the hot, fiery birth uh, in the Big Bang. Um, now, this image was taken by uh, the Planck satellite. Um, the, the very, very first image of the cosmic microwave background that was taken, Stephen Hawkins called this the face of God, um, which I think is a, a great description because this is, you know, this is a, an image of what our universe looked like uh, just after the Big Bang, I mean, it's a little bit afterwards, but fairly close to after the Big Bang. And uh, the red spots you can see here and uh, are slightly hotter than the blue spots. Um, and what you can see here is it's a bit like a battle plan <laughs> right after the Big Bang. There's a bit of a war that happens after the Big Bang. Gravity is trying to pull everything together, but it's so hot and it's so dense that light can move matter about. And it's crazy to think about this, isn't it? You know, that, that, that light could actually move you about to kick you off your chair. But right after the Big Bang, the universe is so hot and so dense that the light can actually move matter around. So where it's cool in this cosmic microwave background, that's where the light has pushed the matter back out again. And this is basically a fight between gravity and light this map of the universe. And what's amazing about this, this map, this iconic image, is that you can analyse how many hot spots there are and how many cold spots there are, and that tells you exactly how much light and how much gravity there was right after the Big Bang, which tells you about what our universe is made up of. And this amazing image has led us to a point where the cosmologists in the world, and I'm, I, my, my formal title is Professor of Observational Cosmology, um, the cosmologists in this world can now be broadly split into two camps. All right, so our first camp of cosmologists, we're going to call them the smug cosmologists, which is a little bit rude, but we'll call them the smug cosmologists anyway. And they are rightfully smug because they've taken this amazing image, they've built the instrumentation, they've built the computer and the statistical analysis to, to extract information from this image. And that tells us with very precise precision exactly what our universe is made up of. So I can tell you that our universe is made up of 26.8% dark matter, 68.3% dark energy, and 4.9% of ordinary matter. And this is phenomenal that at this day and age, we can tell you now with, this, with decimal place precision what our universe is made up with. So congratulations to my colleagues in the smug cosmologist camp. Now we'll move on to the other camp of which I am a member, and we'll call these the embarrassed cosmologists, because um, if you go and talk to anyone who's normal and you say, um, uh, yeah, so 26.8% uh, of our universe is made up of dark matter, and they're like, yeah, what's that then? Mm -hmm. Don't know. And they're like, okay, uh, do you know anything about it? Well, it's invisible. Like, right. Um, can't touch it, can't see it, can't smell it. We're sure it's there, though, because of the effect that it has on the things we can see. 
You're going, right. So you've invented a particle to explain some observations. You're like, mm. well, what about this dark energy? Yeah. We don't know what that is either. All right, right, okay. Is there anything you do understand in this pie chart? Yeah, yeah well, particle physicists can really explain that 4.9% of ordinary matter. We found the Higgs boson, Nobel Prize. That part of the diagram is nailed. So that's, that's where we're at on the embarrassed cosmology side. Um, so some people uh, may see this as a bit of an epic fail, that uh, at this point in this day and age, we've got to this uh, point where we can only explain uh, just under 5% of our universe. Um, but I like to think of this as a, uh, a really amazing opportunity for discovery because the physics that I teach at university, the physics that we all teach at university, cannot explain this dark matter and dark energy. We, we, we don't know what these dark entities are. We cannot explain it with the physics that we teach at university. Um, so, so that means we're missing something. We're missing something that makes up 95% of our universe. And that's genuinely really exciting, because when, you when you're missing something that big, it means there's a big discovery to be made. Um, if I was giving you my sort of more standard research talk, then I'd talk to you on, on the more, well, all, all theories to explain these dark universes are quite exotic, but we're going to go super exotic today, because we're going to be talking about multiverse. Um, this is what we think the dark matter would look like if we could put on dark matter spectacles and see it. We think it makes this web-like structure. This is a computer simulation. And, and we can map it out now. These are some of the images that, that I've made. Nobody knows what the dark matter particle is, by the way, but I'm, I'm fairly certain that if it had a color, it would be pink. So just, just if, if you ever see any dark matter pictures, it, it should be pink. I think that's fine. It, it appears to house all of the galaxies um, that you can see. And uh, this is an amazing image from some of my competitors in, in the US. They've, this is actually a real map of dark matter in our universe. This is uh, mapping out about a uh, fifth of the night sky. Um, it's, it's phenomenal that we can do that. And, and I do believe that my particle physics cousins will find a dark matter particle soon enough. I mean, they're, they're working really hard at CERN. They're, they're collecting all of the liquid xenon that exists on planet Earth and putting it in the same place to have this massive vat to try and catch one of these dark matter particles. I, I do feel that we will be able to explain that dark matter component soon, but it's the dark energy component that's really, really confusing us, that we really genuinely do not understand in this cosmic cocktail. So, to help explain it, I'm going to pull up an equation, Einstein's field equation. At this point, you're all looking quite worried. This is the bonus of doing this in person, because I can actually see your faces behind your mask. Everyone's gone, oh, this talk has taken a significant term for the worst. Don't worry, you don't need to know what any of these terms are. For those of you who have taken a physics degree, you'll be feeling very happy at this point, because you'll have seen this equation before. Einstein's field equation tells us how the universe works. It tells us how things move and how things travel in the universe, how time changes. Um, the terms on the left-hand side tell you about how space and time curves, and the terms on the right-hand side tell you about mass and energy. And it's this field equation, which is where that famous e equals mc squared comes from. It says that mass and energy are equivalent. And you can read this equation as curve space-time tells mass and light how to move, uh, or you can read it in the other way that mass and energy tells space and time how to curve. Now, this little term here in the middle is maybe something that you'll have heard about. This is known as Einstein's cosmological constant. So when we talk about this dark energy in our universe that appears to be causing the expansion of our universe to accelerate, the easiest explanation is Einstein's cosmological constant here, this, this lambda term here. And I wonder how long it will take us in COVID variants before we get to lambda. Um, <laughs> It's, we're, we're getting there in the Greek alphabet. Anyway, that's the lambda term. And uh, for those of you who have taken physics at university, which I know some of you will have, you'll remember when you derive these equations, this comes about just because you're solving an integral. Um, and for those of you who haven't taken physics but have done maths, you'll remember when you solve an integral, you can always add in a constant. And that's just where this term comes from. Now, Einstein called this his greatest blunder. So he put this term in to his field equations because when he derived them, 
he realised that it would predict that the universe was expanding, and he didn't like that idea. He wanted the universe to be static, and so he added in this constant of integration, Einstein's constant, to make the universe static. Um, but then when Edwin Hubble found out that the universe was actually expanding, Einstein said, oh, it was my greatest blunder uh, to put that in there. It's not needed at all. My field equations predict this expansion. Um, now we find that the universe's expansion is accelerating, and so we need to put this term back in again um, to, to give us that extra energy, to give us that rapid expansion of the universe. Um, but I don't know about you, but I don't like it when maths just tells me to do something. I kind of like to know what the origin of that term is. Yeah, so, so the, the terms that I've blacked out in grey there, they all have meaning. They, they associate with, with uh, on, the, on the left, how space and time curves, and on the right, actual things, mass and energy in the universe. But that, that constant, it's, it really just comes from maths. So, so what could be causing this term? Is it, what, what is the origin of this term if we want to explain this dark energy in our universe? And one of the best ways to, uh, to, or one of the best theories of what could be behind Einstein's cosmological constant is to think about the physics of nothingness. Okay, I want you to take yourself, um, to relax a little bit and take yourself out into the universe, into a giant void. There are, most of the universe are just giant voids, all right? There's absolutely nothing around you. There's no galaxies, there's no stars. You're in a complete void of absolute nothingness. I feel quite calm. I don't know about you. Other people don't feel so calm in this environment, but I feel quite calm. All right. There's nothing around you except virtual quantum particles. Now, quantum physics tells us that if you have a vacuum, complete nothingness, that virtual particles can pop in and out of existence. And this isn't just mystic fairy tale maths. You can actually measure this effect in a laboratory. You can make a vacuum and you can see these particles popping in and out of existence. Um, now in space, that void that I got you to sit in is expanding. And when you have an expanding space, these particles can pop into existence more often than they can pop out of existence just because your volume is growing. And that gives our universe energy. As particles pop into existence, they give the universe energy, which drives the expansion, which creates more emptiness, more nothingness, and more opportunity for these virtual particles to pop into existence. And we have this wonderful mechanism to make our universe expand at an ever faster rate. And the only problem, the only problem with this theory is that if you measure this effect in a laboratory, this quantum effect, uh, then we wouldn't be here. Uh, this quantum effect would have started to kickstart the expansion of our universe a very long time ago, and the first stars and galaxies wouldn't have formed, and we wouldn't be here to think about it. So that kind of rules out this physics of nothingness. We very often disagree with particle physicists in the astronomy world. I mean, look, neutrinos, who was right there? We were, not them, good. Um, so <laughs> we often disagree with particle physicists, but this time we're disagreeing with them um, by 60 orders of magnitude. So um, the energy that we're measuring out in the universe is one with 60 zeros after it's smaller than the dark energy that you predict from this quantum effect. So, big problem. Um, we don't know what's causing the expansion of the universe. Um, I could give you a whole lecture on whether it's some new weird force field in the universe. Um, I could tell, talk to you endlessly about whether Einstein's gravity is wrong. Everything I've told you so far is built within that framework of Einstein's field equations. It could be that Einstein's theory is incomplete. Uh, we are testing that. We haven't found any chinks in his armor yet. Um, but today, our theme is the multiverse. Um, so how can we get around this problem with the multiverse? Well, the idea of the multiverse is that the laws of physics are the same in each of the universes, but the way they behave is slightly different. Uh, so for example, gravity is keeping me stuck on the ground at the moment uh, with, uh, at an acceleration of 9.8 meters per second squared. 
Um, but there's nothing in, in physics that tells me it, it has to have that strength, that gravity has to have that strength. So I understand that I can, I can tell you why gravity behaves in the way that it does. So it's called an inverse square law. The further you get away from a mass, the less the gravity is. But I can't tell you how strong that gravity should be. And the idea in the multiverse is that all of these different universes have different gravitational strengths. They would also all have different Einstein's cosmological constances. All right. Let me guide you through, then, the evidence that we have so far for there being multiple universes out there. And we'll come back, we'll link back to Einstein's cosmological constant at the end. Um, first of all, we need to define our universe. Um, so our universe, for me, is what we can observe. All right? So we are limited by the age of the universe. Our universe is 13.8 billion years old. Um, and that means that the furthest away that I can see is how long light has taken to travel for, to us from that 13.8 billion years. All right? So I'm going to call our universe as our observable universe, and that's a sphere around us of a size 13.8 billion light years. Good. Now, what is beyond our universe? Is our universe infinite or is it finite? And to help answer that question, what we can do is we can measure what we call the curvature. Right? So um, if I uh, asked you to measure the curvature of planet Earth uh, from within the Hibernian football stadium, I know we're in London, but Scottish football is really good. And if you wanted to watch Scottish football, you should support the Hibernian team from Edinburgh because they're much better than Celtic and Rangers. <laughs> anyway, this is the Hibernian football pit in Edinburgh. And if I asked you to make your scientific measurement of the curvature of planet Earth from the Hibernian Stadium, you would tell me that the Earth is flat. But because you're all good scientists, you would also give me a margin of error on that measurement, and you would say, I don't know what's happening outside of the stadium, but within the stadium, it's flat. And so then you might want to conduct a better experiment and go somewhere further afield, maybe, maybe uh, Netherlands, which I've got in the bottom right of the corner there. And, uh, and we probably, Netherlands is pretty flat as well. We'd probably come up with the same conclusion that the Earth is flat, uh, but there's a margin of error there. Now, um, I'm, I'm very much hoping, as we are in the British Astronomical Association, that there aren't any flat earthers in the room. Um, uh, because <laughs> if anyone does want to come talk to me about flat earth afterwards, that, that I, well, I've had lots of fun being astronomer royal talking to flat earthers of late. Um, it's, it's a whole new world. Anyway, <laughs> the further you look, of course, you will measure that our earth is curved. All right? And we can measure the curvature of our earth. We need to look further to see the curvature, and that tells us that the Earth is finite. But this same experiment I can conduct in space. All right, so I can ask, what is the curvature of space? And uh, we can measure it out, and, and the, I've made this measurement, various other people have made this measurement as well, and uh, we can tell you that the space is flat, but there's a margin of error on that. Okay, so uh, our best guess is the universe is infinite, so if it's flat, it just goes on and on forever, which would make an infinite universe. Uh, but there's a margin of error on that measurement, and that margin of error tells me that there has to be at least a hundred other universes out there the size of our own. Now, this isn't quite multiverse theory, because uh, those, those other universes are connected to our universe, but if we're defining our universe as just what we can observe, then the, what else is out there has to be at least 100 times larger than our own observable universe. That's our measurement that we've made of how infinite our universe is. So not quite the multiverse, but it just gives you an idea of just how big the universe is out there. All right, um, for our next piece of evidence for the multiverse, uh, we are going to take a little trip uh, through history. And uh, we are going to go back to 1965 Bell Labs, New Jersey. And this is a picture of Penzias and Wilson, uh, who were working for Bell Labs at the time. Um, now, these two were astronomers by night and uh, early mobile phone technology people in the day. Uh, you wouldn't believe it, but this is one of the first mobile phones 
not very mobile. Um, they were working on, could you uh, use microwave radiation to communicate across large distances? And this was one of their receivers, and they had um, a, a microwave emitter uh, across uh, on the other side of uh, New Jersey, and they were trying to communicate, use it to sort of send, send telecommunications. Um, so by day, they did that, and they said to their boss, because uh, they, they, they were both avid astronomers, they said, at night, would it be all right if we pointed it up? Uh, because we really want to see if stars emit in the microwave radiation. And their boss said, fine, do whatever you like at night. Uh, so, so that is indeed what they did. And they pointed this uh, detector, microwave detector, up at the stars at the Milky Way. And they detected microwave radiation. And they wrote a journal article saying that they detected the microwave radiation from stars. Fantastic. Um, now, uh, we heard at the, at the beginning that the BAA has approved um, some papers, um, and to have papers approved, you need to have uh, your peer reviewing them, which is, I'm sure, what the British Astronomical Association does when they uh, approve journal papers. And uh, the referee of this paper um, said, uh, that's, that's lovely, but um, I don't really trust your technology, so what I want you to do is I want you to point your instrument away from the Milky Way, uh, and then what you should see is less microwave radiation than when you're pointing it towards the Milky Way, okay? Because there are many more stars in the Milky Way stripe, so pointing it away from it, you should measure less microwave radiation. And then I will be convinced that you are actually measuring microwave radiation from stars and not from, I don't know, stuff on Earth. And they said, fine, okay, okay. So they pointed it away and uh, they measured a signal. And they were very displeased, they were very displeased. So they did loads of different things. They thought, oh, there's something wrong with the instrument. They spent lots of time calibrating it, measuring it. There's a fantastic story about how they donned protective clothing, which I kind of imagine as them putting on hazmat suits, but I'm not entirely sure what their protective clothing was. But anyway, they put on protective clothing and climbed up into, uh, into the bell here uh, to sweep out all of the pigeon poop. Um, which is one of my favourite stories of two Nobel Prize winners, or, well, they would go on to be Nobel Prize winners, uh, sweeping out the pigeon poop. Um, but lo and behold, every time they looked away from the Milky Way, they still measured this radiation. So this is how science happens, people. They happened to have a friend at the Institute for Advanced Studies in Princeton, and they were going over to have a cup of coffee with him one day to talk about their mo mobile phone technology. Um, and uh, they were chatting away about how they'd had this hilarious weekend sweeping pigeon poop out of... Their, um, their telescope, and uh, across on the other side was uh, Jim Peebles and some of his collaborators, and they said, what, 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 what were you doing? And they were like, ha, 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 we were sweeping out the pigeon poop, and uh, he was like, why? And they were like, oh, because everywhere we look on the sky, we measure this microwave radiation, and Jim Peebles said, how much do you measure? And uh, about three Kelvin, three Kelvin, and they were like, oh. It's exactly what I predicted. So uh, that group had been predicting uh, that the relic radiation from the Big Bang should be there. You should see it up in the night sky. And Penzias and Wilson had inadvertently detected this relic radiation from the Big Bang. So uh, here we go. This is uh, the uh, all-sky microwave map. This is the same map that I showed you right at the beginning with those yellow, red, and blue spots, but now with the Milky Way galaxy superimposed on the top. And um, so these purple, this lovely purple um, stuff you can see here, that's all of the microwave radiation from the stars that Penzias and Wilson were trying to detect. And the stuff you can see behind it, this is the relic radiation from the Big Bang. All right, now, what on earth has this got to do with the multiverse, Catherine? Um, well, uh, when, I, uh, <laughs> when I told my sister that I was thinking about giving a talk about Big Bang and the multiverse, she said, oh, I like that programme. And I said, what? <laughs> because I don't have time to watch television because I'm the astronomer of Scotland and TV's just not on the agenda. Anyway, so I looked it up and she said, oh, are you like that, that character? And I was like, yes, I absolutely like her. And they were like, no, like him. But as I've never know, watched it, I think she's being rude to me, but somebody can tell me in the lunch break. Anyway, um, so Big Bang Theory is that the universe was created in this Big Bang, and you get this hot, fiery radiation everywhere you look. But there's a big, big problem with this theory. Um, everywhere you look, the temperature is exactly the same. And this is a problem uh, because... 
these different parts of the universe shouldn't be able to connect with each other to, to look the same. Let's, let me try and explain this to you. This is called the horizon problem. All right, so here's um, Sheldon on, on planet Earth, and he's made this measurement um, that the temperature of the cosmic microwave background is 2.74 Kelvin, and we know that this radiation comes from the Big Bang, and that means that it's travelled the speed of light times the age of the universe towards Sheldon. Okay? So the distance that light has travelled is sort of the, the age of the universe or our observable universe. Um, and we look on the other side and we see exactly the same temperature. But how does this part of the universe know to look exactly the same as the other part of the universe, because the distance between those two universes is just twice the age of the universe. So there hasn't been enough in time for information to travel from one side to the other side to say, hey, look the same. Let, let me give you an analogy. Um, let's say that you are having a party, and you're going to invite lots and lots of different friends to that party. They don't know each other. They've never met each other before. And you've invited them all to come to your party at about 7 o'clock but they all turn up at 6.54 wearing mauve, every single one of them. And you think, that's a bit strange that you're all wearing mauve. How did you all know to get dressed up in the same colour and come at the same time? And then you think, ah, you must have got connected on Facebook beforehand. The different parts of the universe do not have Facebook to connect to each other, or if they did, Facebook couldn't communicate fast enough between either side. They can't be connected. So, Either we are in a very special place in the universe and we are at the epicentre of the Big Bang. Okay? If we are at the epicentre of the Big Bang, this all makes sense because the universe was all around us, all the same temperature, and then it exploded out. And so that's why everything looks the same to us because we are at the centre of the universe. If you want to think that you're at the centre of the universe, that's absolutely fine. Certainly my son believes that he is at the centre of the universe, and he's at the centre of my universe, that's for sure. Um, but if you want to be a cosmologist, if you want to join the cool club of cosmologists, then you have to adopt the cosmological principle and the Copernican principle that we are not special. Sorry. I mean, you're all special to me, but that we are not in a special place in the universe. We are not at the epicentre of the Big Bang. If you're going to adopt that policy, then something very strange must have happened in the very early universe. Because we can't, everywhere we look, the universe looks the same. And there just hasn't been enough time for the universe to communicate. So something very strange must have happened. And the theory that we have to explain this, you might have heard of, is called inflation. And this is the cornerstone of cosmology. Inflation underpins absolutely everything we understand about the universe. But it's very, very strange. The idea is that the universe is created in a big bang, creates something about the size of a pea. Um, but then in this very, very hot, dense universe, the fundamental forces that we know and love gravity, electromagnetism, the strong and the weak force, are unified in a single force. And that force gives a huge amount of energy to the universe that inflates it essentially instantaneously up to the very large scales we see today. And if that happens, if you have that essentially instantaneous expansion, then everything's going to look the same because back in the past everything was in a P and was all the same temperature. And that's why... The universe looks the same everywhere we look. That's why everyone knew to turn up to the party in Mauve. Um, how can this, this, this is a crazy idea, crazy idea that you can go from, from basically nothing up to cosmological scales. Um, but one of the best ways I have to explain this is to take you back to your youth. Um, so I want you to uh, take yourself back to when you were very, very little and I want you to imagine you're sat on the top of a hill and you've got a toy truck next to you. Okay, there's no batteries in your toy truck. It's just a normal toy truck. And you're just sat at the top of the hill. You've got your toy truck next to you. And your toy truck is just going to start slowly rolling down the hill. And you're little, so you don't know about gravity at this point. And you're looking at that, and you go, that's a bit strange. It doesn't have any batteries in it. It's just slowly rolling down the hill. And as it keeps going down the hill, it picks up speed and picks up more speed. Now, you're grown-ups now, so you know that that's gravity. It's the force of gravity that has given energy to your truck to pull it down the hill. 
All right, so it's the same idea with inflation. You've got some forces in the universe, and, and we think they're united at this point, and forces can give energy to a system, just like your truck gets pulled down the hill by gravity. Those forces have given the universe so much energy that it can expand up to very, very large scales. And this, there are oodles of different inflation theories that can explain this very rapid expansion. Now, let's take you sort of back to that hill. Um, how is your truck going to stop rolling? So it might be that the hill flattens out at the bottom, or it might be that it crashes into a wall. Either way, it will stop eventually. But what makes our universe stop expanding? And this is the big problem with inflation theories. There is no easy mechanism to stop the universe inflating once it started. So we, we believe this period of inflation has to have happened in the early universe, but we don't know how the universe stopped inflating. Ha! Huh. This is where we come to multiverse theory. So 90% of the different inflation theories that are out there stop our own universe inflating by starting other universes inflating. And this, and we go, remind you, inflation theory is a cornerstone of astronomy. We need this inflationary period to explain all sorts of things that we observe in the universe. And yet the underlying theories behind it predict that our universe wouldn't be the only universe created in this mechanism. And so to build our universe, our observable universe, and to make it stop inflating, because we know that it's not inflating rapidly today, you have to stop our universe inflating by starting another to inflating. And that's called chaotic inflation theory. And this is something that we can actually test, and I'll come back to that in the end. All right, I'm running out of time, so I'm going to blitz through uh, the last piece of evidence for the multiverse theory, which some people are very happy about, and other people are really not happy about. And I'm <laughs> going to be delighted to talk to you afterwards to see what you think. The final piece of evidence for this idea of the multiverse theory is that you exist, that we are here. We have these four fundamental forces in our universe, gravity, electromagnetism, the weak and nuclear, weak and strong nuclear force. And it, if you look at these fundamental forces, there's no reason why they have the strength that they do. But they are very, very well tuned collectively for life to exist. And I'll give you some examples. All right, the sun, absolutely essential for life on Earth. If you changed the strength of the electromagnetic force, so how strongly a proton is attracted to a neutron, uh, sorry, a proton is attracted to an electron, if you change that number by just 4%, the sun would explode. Those reactions would happen far too quickly and it would simply explode. So 4%, small number. All right, the strong nuclear force is what governs how things work inside a nucleus of an atom. Um, if you change the strong nuclear force by just 2%, then there wouldn't be any hydrogen remaining after the Big Bang. So I said after the Big Bang, the universe is very hot and it's very dense. And you do find reactions happening in that very hot, dense environment. So hydrogen does fuse into helium. But the universe expands and cools during this inflationary period, so not all the hydrogen is used up. And then there's enough hydrogen left to make the stars, which are needed for life. But if you change that weak nuclear force, uh, sorry, the strong nuclear force by just 2%, then those fusion reactions would happen much faster, and we would have no hydrogen left after the Big Bang. No hydrogen, no stars, no life. Ha. Huh. OK, if you increase the mass of an electron very slightly, you can't make DNA. If you decrease the mass of an electron very slightly, you can't make stars. Mass of the electron is very finely balanced. And this one, the smallest change of all, if you increase or decrease the mass of a proton by just 0.2%, you get no atoms at all. And then back full circle to where we started, the reason why I have transferred myself from I hate the multiverse theory, I'm not even talking about it, to, huh, you know, there might be something in it. I really can't explain the dark energy that I'm researching at the moment. I find it really hard to explain. Um, the cosmological constant, Einstein's cosmological constant, is the nicest, cleanest way to explain it. And it could be that the vacuum energy, the, the cosmological constant that we expect, uh, is, is normal in most of the multiverses, but in our universe, where we exist, uh, it 
has a different value, a much, much lower value. Uh, because if it didn't, we wouldn't be here. So I've given you three different pieces of evidence for there being multiple universes. The first is a bit of a cheat. The first is just saying that if you define the universe as what we can observe, there has to be at least 100 other universes out there the same size as our own. But that's not really multiverse theory. The horizon problem that I showed you, that necessity for our universe to experience that very rapid period of inflation, uh, the best theories that you have to explain that infer that there has to be multiple universes out there. That's probably your strongest piece of evidence for the multiverse. Uh, and then if there are multiple universes out there, then this, this amazing balance between all of our forces making it just perfect for life make a lot of sense because obviously if we're in one of these universes where all of these dials are tuned just perfectly, of course, of course we would live uh, in that universe. Of course we would be in the one that was fine-tuned for life. And so all of the other multiple universes out there uh, would just be sort of friendless clouds of, of protons or, or lots of helium or you know, different types of universes, but we would be in the one that was perfect for life. <laughs> now, people do take this idea a bit further, and this is where I'm going to go back to my grumpy position at the start. I'm not even contemplating this. All right. And there is an extension to this whole idea of multiverses. This is called the other world theory. Um, so if you look deep into quantum physics, um, quantum physics uh, has obviously, you must have heard of Schrodinger's cat. The cat is in the box, but is it alive or dead? Uh, you won't know until you look. And this is a, a sort of a, a fundamental, this, this analogy is, is a way of looking at quantum physics. You don't know how things are going to behave until you look. It's the act of looking that makes a decision. So an electron can behave like a wave or a particle, and it's not until you look at it that it, you, you see which way it has behaved. And quantum physicists don't like that idea. They don't like the idea that the act of you looking makes a decision. And so the idea, this extension to this multiverse theory, is that the act of making a decision doesn't, uh, doesn't make, uh, sorry, the act of looking doesn't make a decision, it indeed splits the universe into two. So every time a decision is made, both outcomes happen, but a different universe is created each time. Uh, <laughs> I find this one really, really hard. Mathematically, this works. And I'm going to leave it up to you to decide whether this is a wild fantasy uh, from mathematics or whether it is a credible version of our universe. I don't like it when maths tells me that something exists. I like it to be tangible. Um, but the maths does show that this version, these multiple universes, every time a decision is made, could exist. So uh, I am a professor of observational cosmology. I'm not a theoretical cosmologist, so my job is to collect the data. And our best way of testing this is looking at those inflation theories, because it's the inflation theories that predict these multiple universes exist. So this is the Simons Observatory. Um, it is the next thing that is coming up to look at the cosmic microwave background in its polarised light. So uh, for some of you, you might have um, Polaroid uh, glasses instead of sunglasses. Um, so light actually spins. And if you look at how that light spins, then you can find out huge amounts of information about that inflationary period in our universe. So we're super excited about the Simons Observatory coming up. And then uh, this is what I'm working on at the moment. Uh, this is my first time working really closely with people in the US. And it's, I don't know if there's anyone in from America um, today, but oh, I love working with Americans. Because when you work with Europeans, it's very, we're very, we consider things, we're very we're diligent, we, we work through things consistently. And it's exactly the same with the Americans, but they whoop a lot. So, so whenever you go to a meeting, they're like, yeah! And you're like, oh, OK, I can do this. Anyway, this is the Vera Rubin Observatory. Um, this was uh, it in August uh, 2018, and uh, this is it now. We are close to seeing our first light. We're about a year behind schedule because we had to down tools on the mountain uh, for a good six months during the pandemic. Um, but this is the most amazing instrument. We are going to be surveying the night sky on repeat for 10 years. Um, we're going to be building up a movie of the universe. Um, when uh, my colleagues first started designing uh, this new observatory, 
uh, they went to Congress in America and they said, uh, we really want to understand dark energy. And Congress said, but three people have already been given a Nobel Prize for dark energy. So they went back to the drawing board and then they went back to Congress about a year later and they said, we want to find killer asteroids that might one day obliterate planet Earth. Like, where do we sign? Where do we sign, people? And that's why I like working with Americans. Um, it's going to do both. It's going to help us understand dark energy and also find killer asteroids. Um, so we're really excited about this project. Um, and it's going to give us these amazing maps of the universe. We're going to be looking deeper than we've ever looked. We're going to be, our deepest image is going to be looking back 12 billion light years across the entire southern sky. It's going to be absolutely phenomenal. Um, but uh, these, this is one of my best observing nights on the ground. And this is what, I mean, you guys are astronomers, but you look at quite nearby galaxies. My galaxies are typically 7 to 10 billion light years away, and this is what they look like from the best observing site on planet Earth with the best weather. Um, but when you go up into space, everything is absolutely beautiful and so we're really excited that we're also um, about to see the launch of Euclid and um, so um, I could have given a whole talk today about how excited I am about JWST being launched soon um, but this is the next one that will go up after JWST um, which is going to be working in tandem with Rubin so we're going to have the beautiful crystal clear vision from above the atmosphere combined with the might of Rubin on the ground. Um, and I'm really excited to see what they discover. So we're going to be able to probe these different inflation theories to see, to really understand those theories and then to see what they infer about there being multiverses. We can also look for, where's my bubbles? Oh, I've lost my bubbles. But if you have uh, bubble universes, then you'd expect them to kind of merge with each other. And you can look for those patterns, those ripples in the distributions of galaxies and also in the distribution of the cosmic microwave background. So these are things that we can actually look for. So we can actually test this theory, even though it is predicting there being other universes that we'll never observe. So... Um, if you are interested to read more, um, uh, these are good Christmas presents. You'd, this one's not a Christmas present. This one's free to read. You can just Google my name, Heyman's Dark Universe. Um, so that's more about uh, the, the dark universe measurements. And then if you're looking for a Christmas present, um, I can strongly recommend this one, Max Tegmark, Our Mathematical Universe. Um, it's re it really sort of expands on what I've been talking about today and really um, helped me build this talk. And uh, Sean Carroll's book's absolutely fantastic as well. OK, good. That's me. <laughs> Thank you very much, Catherine, for an extremely lively <laughs> presentation. Uh, this is this is subject is a bit of a field of unbounded speculation, isn't it? So. Well, well, I hope I hope I was showing you that it wasn't speculation that we can actually measure it. <laughs> Do, would anybody like to uh, ask a question? Yes, sir, uh, gentleman in the blue. Uh, uh, we were always told that there was nothing outside of our universe. You know, you know our universe wasn't expanding into anything. Surely if our universe bubble hits another universe bubble it means that there's some you know the, the that uh, it is expanding into something it, what, what's the view is, yeah. is uh, there something out, outside of the universe so so I, I, we don't know i mean this is this, this is the joy of it uh, and I should probably come back to the microphone so you can hear me. Um, so, yeah, so I, I don't know who told you that we, it wasn't expanding into anything, because we don't know. So we, we, we only can observe what's inside our own universe, and then we have to infer what's outside of it. So that, that number I gave you, that there has to be at least 100 other universes out there the size of our own universe, comes from measurements within our own universe about the curvature of our own universe. So um, our best theory is that our universe is infinite. So, and this really blows my mind, that this concept of the multiverse is that you have multiple infinite universes. I mean, it really is sort of to infinity and beyond type thing. It's <laughs> um, and it's really hard to, to think your way around this. And I, and I think this is why it's such an interesting subject, that you know, mathematics is the language of science, and mathematics shows that these things can, can happen. But our brains can't can't imagine infinity anyway, and then an infinite number of infinity, 
you know, it completely blows your mind, but the maths does show you that that's possible. So that's, that's the question here. I mean, do we... We know that maths is so useful at explaining what's happening around us. So do, do we trust the maths and just, just run with it? Or, or do we need sort of tangible explanations for the maths that we find? So cosmo the cosmological constant is a really interesting one there. It, it just comes about mathematically, and we don't have a, a, a sort of a tangible origin for where that, that extra term in Einstein's field equations comes from. So it's, uh, I mean, I'm an observer. My, my job is to get the data. And, and, and the more data I get, the more I can test these, these models um, and to, to, to see what 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 we can rule out on the theory side. You know, can we rule out these chaotic inflation theories so they do have um, things that we can observe in them? And if we can rule those out, then, then, then we can rule out the multiverse, because you know? <laughs> it's, it's a consequence of those theories. It's just most of those theories, most of the inflation theories do have that, that phenomenon that the only way that they can stop a universe inflating is to start someone inflating somewhere else in space and time. But yeah, they could collide with each other, and that's something we can look for. Yeah. We can actually accept questions from people watching on YouTube. We've, oh, wow. we've got uh, 56 people watching live. Hello, everyone on YouTube. <laughs> they're about 30 seconds behind us. All oh, right, okay. I've, 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 had a quest I've had a question through YouTube, right. which I don't know quite how to interpret. It's uh, from somebody called Caleb Bellak. Hi, and, Caleb. And um, they ask, what is the big deal of dark matter? What is the big deal? What's uh, the big deal with dark matter? That's an excellent question. Um, what's the question mean? Maybe the question is, <laughs> what do you think dark matter is? What's the big deal with dark matter? So, um, uh, the Vera Rubin Observatory that I just uh, told you about that, that I'm working on is uh, named after the very fabulous Vera Rubin, who, with uh, Jack Ford, found the first sort of key evidence for dark matter. Um, that needs to sort of surround each and every galaxy, otherwise the stars would simply fly out into space. And there's lots and lots of other evidence as well, and you have to invite me back for another talk and I'll tell you about dark matter. Um, at the moment, the big deal with dark matter is our best guess of what the dark matter particle was, which is called the light supersymmetric particle, should have been found at CERN by now. You know, CERN wasn't just supposed to find the Higgs boson. It was very, very expensive. <laughs> I mean, hats off to my particle physics cousins. They are using it for amazing things. But, you know, Higgs boson was just supposed to be the first discovery. And then it was supposed to find the light supersymmetric particle, tick dark matter off the list. And then it was supposed to understand different things about neutrinos and things like that. Um, so the fact that it hasn't found this, our best guess for what the dark matter particle is, has kind of thrown the dark matter community into some sort of turmoil because that, that best guess theory um, has now been ruled out. Um, so, you know, people have spent years of their lives doing supersymmetric theory to explain the dark mass particle, and, and the, the, the first prediction from it has already been ruled out. Um, so, uh, dark matter could be lots of different things. So, there's something called the axion, which is quite an exciting particle, mainly because it might also explain dark energy. So, uh, an axion can behave like dark matter or like dark energy, depending on what sort of mood it's in that particular day. Um, and uh, so, that's interesting. And the other thing which I think a lot of people are really interested in is could gravity behave differently in different parts of the universe? And that's something that we can test. Um, so what I've been working on is um, can, do we need a dark matter particle around galaxies? Unfortunately, everything we've looked at, yes, you do. It's very hard to explain the observations we make with galaxies without a dark matter particle. Um, dark energy, however, Possibly you could explain if gra gravity works differently in those voids. Um, and that's something that we're testing as well. So we don't have enough data for that yet, but we are testing it. Because you've got to test these things. I mean, you, we shouldn't take things as, as, as gospel proof. You know, it, it, you shouldn't sort of... Just because I teach physics at uh, undergraduate level, it, it doesn't mean that it's the absolute truth. That's the way science works. You know, we, we develop and we evolve. And we clearly have something wrong at the moment because we've had to invent these two dark entities to explain our observations. So that is what I think the deal is with dark matter, Caleb. <laughs> we, we've got quite a few questions coming in on the YouTube channel. All oh, right, yeah, got, so YouTube's going wild. Yeah, we've got... Uh, <laughs> Daryl Dobbs is asking... Is Hi, Daryl. Is it possible for dark energy and dark matter to change from one to the other? Yeah. 
Yeah, brilliant question, Daryl. All right, so these dark entities, as I said, we don't know what they are. They're invisible. We can't touch them. We just look at the way they, they affect our universe. Um, so one avenue that theorists are pursuing at the moment is let's make Catherine less embarrassed in her embarrassed cosmologist camp, and instead of making her talk about two dark tooth fairies, we'll just have one dark tooth fairy that can behave like dark matter or dark energy, and this is this axion theory. Um, there is also um, a dark matter theory that can also, uh, there's another one that could also interact with the dark energy, so some sort of combined force. Um, it's, it's like a, a new force field that looks like dark energy but can also behave like dark matter. So it, it's very exciting. I mean, there are literally new papers every day with different theories, um, which is great fun because they take my data and my, some of my colleagues' data um, and they try and um, sort of give evidence to their different theories by the observations that we're making. So it's really exciting, uh, but we're not there yet. You know, the data that we're looking at is just small parts of the sky, and that's why we're super excited about these new missions that are coming online to get really high resolution images of that cosmic microwave background and then these incredibly deep images of the universe with the Vera Rubin Observatory. It's going to be super exciting. And we might find killer asteroids. So, We've got a question from uh, Henry Webb. <laughs> asks, Hi, Henry. Asks, will we eventually be able to actually measure and see dark matter rather than relying on evidence of how it interacts with normal matter? Well, um, Henry... Google, Google Heyman's and the Killer Degree Survey, and you'll see um, my group's map of dark matter. So yes, we can map out the dark matter by looking at how it curves space and time. So have a look at that. We've mapped it out. Um, uh, my competitors in the US have done the same thing. Their map is bigger than ours, but everything in the US is bigger. The cars, the Coca-Cola, the burgers. He's also in the US as well. He's in the US as well. <laughs> All right, well, everything's bigger in the US. It's not necessarily better. <laughs> you, you quickly mentioned two methods you, of uh, instruments that you're going to use in the land base and the satellite. I just wondered after we spent, or no, not we, but after the Americans have spent 10 billion on it, will, the, will you be able to use the James Webb? And will it have any purpose, you know, to do for the work, area of work that you're yes, interested in? Yes, yes, let's get excited about the James Webb Space Telescope. <laughs> Everyone behave yourself. They've already dropped it once. So <laughs> it was due to be launched on the 18th of December. Small hiccup. But luckily, you know, it's been designed to, you know, go up on a rocket. So it didn't really matter that it got dropped because it's, you know, it's going to be shaken to bits anyway. Whew, that was a nervous few days. So 22nd of December, uh, midday on 22nd of December, that's when it's going to be launched. Um, everyone behave up until then because we really don't want it to explode on the launch pad because it was 10 billion, as you said. Um, right, James Webb is going to be looking in the near infrared um, I like to think of it as our kind of our commando of the night skies, you know, like the the the, <laughs> the movies where the commandos go out in their infrared goggles and they see everything in green. That's what the James Webb Space Telescope is. It's our new commando up in space. Um, will it help my research? No, not really. So um, it is designed to. So I mean, you're you're all uh, you're all astronomers, so you know you've got a choice when you set up your telescope. You can go wide field and and shallow, or you can go narrow and deep. You know, you, you've got that choice of how you set up your telescope. James Webb Space Telescope is narrow but deep. So it is going to be looking at sort of small patches of sky, but incredibly deep. So actually the volume of the universe that they're going to be looking at is, is huge. And they're going to be going back and looking at the very first stars and galaxies that have ever been born. And at the same time, focusing on nearby stars to look at the weather on exoplanets. I mean, this blows my mind that we can measure how weather is changing on exoplanets outside of our solar system. It's phenomenal what this piece of technology is going to do. So both looking at the birth of the universe and the birth on other planets in, in our solar system. But for the stuff that I do, you know, we're looking at the universe as a whole. And so we need these maps of the entire sky. So we are uh, also these, so Vera Rubin, it is, uh, let me guess, it's a 10, 10 square degree field of view. And 
So it takes us three nights to map out the entire night sky, and then we go back and we do it again. So each piece of sky gets visited every three nights, and that's how we can see things move, like asteroids coming in our direction, or um, black holes merging, or you know, quasars going crazy, things like that. Um, but we're doing that across the whole sky, so we can look at these sort of large universe changes. So no, James Webb won't help me, but I'm still ultra excited about it anyway. <laughs> Any other questions here? Yeah, gentleman in green. Thank you. Question I'd like to ask is, is the rate of the stretching of space, which is sometimes measured by the scale factor, occurring at a different rate in the high density regions of the universe as the low density regions? Uh, and it sounds like nodding, yes it is, is the answer. And if it is, if it is doing that, you've got a different, different Hubble constant in different parts of the universe. So how do we, when we're measuring distant galaxies, know that the the rate they're moving away is due to a differing Hubble constant or due to peculiar velocities uh, against a background Hubble constant? That is an excellent question. So I'm going to translate it for, in case people didn't know uh, what the, the terms were there. Um, so our, our theory is that the universe is expanding um, and uh, this dark energy is causing that expansion to accelerate and get faster and faster. Okay. So, But if I take just a small region of the universe... Um, then it's going to have that global expansion. But if it's a dense region of the universe, gravity will still be trying to slow it down. So, I mean, my favourite theory of the universe, bar well, 20 years ago before it was ruled out, was that our universe was expanding, but there was enough stuff in our universe that the gravity would stop that expansion and pull it back in on itself. This is my, my favourite model of the universe, because... Because I like it, because it just comes back in on itself. You get a fiery crunch and another universe is born. It's, that's, it's a very happy model for me. Um, unfortunately, that one's been ruled out. Um, but in, so in, if you look at sort of different spheres in the universe, some will be expanding at the global rate, but some will be contracting just because there's a cluster of galaxies there and there's enough gravity to pull it back in again. Um, so, you're, so you're right that the, sort of the expansion rate depends on the, sort of the environment that you're in. And so then the question is, how can you be sure... That, that what we're measuring, this sort of this, this increasing expansion of the universe, is, is real. Maybe we're just in a strange place in the universe. I think this is where you're going, sir. That maybe sort of around us, we're in a part of the universe where things are behaving differently. That is one answer to, to the questions that we're finding. Um, but because our observations now are so um, extensive... So we're looking at lots of different directions now around us on the sky. We're not just looking at small patches of the sky. And we're also going incredibly deep into the universe. So these measurements are being made out to oh, about 5 billion light years away. So these are very deep into the universe all the way around us. So it would have to be a very, very big void, for example, that we were in. Because if we were in a void, then you'd expect that expansion to be going a bit faster. Um, so it would have to be a very, very big void, and then we would have to go back to that we're special, which I'm very happy with. If ever, I mean, all, a lot of what I've explained today can be answered with we're special, and there's a special higher being that's created a wonderful universe for us. And I'm, I'm, if that's your opinion, I'm absolutely happy for you to have it, um, because I think I would like to have that too. That would make me happy. But anyway, unfortunately, I'm not there. So um, we're not special, so that's why we think we're not in the centre of a big void. But yes, you could explain these observations in that way. Well, I think I need to put an end to this yeah, discussion. Yeah, well, we could talk all day. Yeah, we could indeed. <laughs> uh, uh, we, we, we've bitten into the tea break a bit, but I thought that was so interesting. We, we do on. that. Well, one last uh, big round of applause Thank for you. Professor Catherine <laughs> Hayes. So now it's the tea break for about 20 minutes, and at 16.15 we will get back together and we will hear from Professor Sarah Russell about the Winchcombe meteorite. Well, that was very nice. They do nice biscuits here, so that's a, a good mark to the Royal Society of Medicine. Our next speaker is Professor Sarah Russell. Sarah is Merit Researcher in Meteoritics and Senior Research Leader for Earth Sciences at the Natural History Museum. 
So they don't just do dinosaurs there, they do space rocks as well. She uses meteorites and other ext extraterrestrial rocks to learn about the formation and evolution of the solar system and the moon specifically. Uh, she's a team member on the uh, Hayabusa 2 and the OSIRIS-REx missions, which are uh, spacecrafts bound for asteroids. And she's a science board member for the MX, MMX mission, the JAXA MMX mission, which aims to return material from Phobos, moon of Mars, back to the Earth. So that's pretty ambitious stuff. And she is going to talk to us today about the Winchcombe meteorite. Please give a welcome to Professor Sarah Russell. Thank you so much for that introduction. And um, hello, everybody. It's really nice to be here. Uh, I'm afraid I'm going to kind of bring you down to earth with a bump now after talking about infinite numbers of infinite universes. Uh, instead, we're going to talk about a sort of splat of dirt on somebody's driveway. Um, so, <laughs> which is the Winchcombe meteorite that landed um, earlier this year. So first of all, I'm going to tell you a little bit about what is a meteorite. So a meteorite is any natural extraterrestrial object that uh, falls to Earth. Uh, so it can be... Uh, can be made of anything. And part of the puzzle, like being a meteorologist, is basically, it's, um, it, yeah, it's, it's, it's a bit like you just don't know, it's a bit like having an unwrapped present. You don't know where it's come from. It's, it's, um, it's different to, to a space mission in that respect, where it's, if you're involved in a space mission, you know exactly where the samples come from. You've had a chance to choose, help choose where, it, where the sample has been uh, collected, whereas meteorites, it's, it's an absolute lucky dip what you're going to get, which is sort of exciting um, in some ways. Um, a meteoroid is uh, a rock that uh, is uh, in space and heading for us. Uh, when it uh, comes through the Earth's atmosphere, it starts to burn up and it becomes a meteor, or if it's really big, it's called a fireball. Uh, and um, the important thing about meteorites is that they can help tell us about the formation of our solar system and the evolution of our solar system. So I work at the Natural History Museum, so we have got a massive meteorite collection there. We don't just have dinosaurs. Um, so we've been collecting them for over 200 years, and uh, the one on the top left here is called the Wold Cottage Meteorite. Uh, this fell in Yorkshire in 1795. Uh, meteorites are always named after the place where they land, so they're always, they always have a geographic name. They're like wombles in that respect. Uh, but um, Wall Cottage is a really special one for us because um, at that time the establishment figures um, didn't really think that meteorites could exist, that didn't really think that, that there could be extraterrestrial rocks that land uh, on Earth and people that thought they saw them were often dismissed as uh, raving lunatics basically. But because Wall Cottage landed in the land of a, a gentleman who's actually uh, owned a newspaper and was quite well respected and well connected with uh, people at the Royal Society, um, the uh, Wall Cottage meteorite was actually accepted as something that had come from space. It was compared to other rocks with similar stories and found to have a similar composition. And so then the birth of uh, meteoritics as a discipline um, started to evolve. Uh, so there's a few of our other meteorites here. On the right-hand side is a meteorite called Campo de Cielo. So this was found uh, in Argentina. And it wasn't seen to fall, uh, but it probably fell thousands of years ago. Um, and the name Campo de Cielo means field of the skies in Spanish. And it's a translation of the uh, indigenous language who, uh, who had kind of folklorish accounts of... of uh, of the sky coming down, and, um, and they were probably describing the fall of this, this meteorite, although there's no written record of that time. Uh, then on the left-hand side is a meteorite called Imolite. This is a beautiful meteorite. It looks like a, piece of, like a piece of stained glass that's in the main hall of our meteorite. Uh, and on, one on the right there is uh, Nuck, which is famous for two things. First of all, it's famous for um, having come from Mars, and actually it was this Martian rock um, that first showed that there was water on Mars. So in the 1970s, 
uh, scientists at the museum showed that it contained little clay minerals um, that must have formed by the actions of water. And this is the first evidence that uh, other planets may have uh, water on them. Uh, and the other thing it's famous for is that um, it landed in about 100 years ago in Egypt, and it, and it was rumoured to have killed a dog when it landed. It hit a, hit a dog. But that's not completely verified. Okay, so because this is a Christmas lecture, I'm going to tell you about the Christmas meteorite, uh, which is Barwell. So Barwell is the biggest meteorite to fall in the UK, and it fell to Earth on Christmas Eve in 1965 as a shower of stones uh, in the small village of Barwell. Um, and this is a couple inspecting a hole in their, in their window. Uh, a meteorite came, bit of, it actually fell as a shower, so it fell as several stones across the, across the town. Uh, but this one bit fell through their window. And uh, of course, being the night of Christmas Eve, um, they couldn't get a glacier in till the New Year, so they had a very, very cold Christmas. Um, but they also had a meteorite, so hopefully that was some consolation to them. I don't know. Um, so it's quite interesting to compare this meteorite fall with the one I'm going to tell you about, uh, the Winchcombe meteorite. So when Barwell fell, although people did see the fireball, there was no one to kind of collate all of the observations to, um, to no kind of central point where people could report having seen the fireball, uh, which is really helpful, as I'll, I'll come into later. Um, and um, there was no kind of collection program, nobody kind of officially went out and, and made sure that they collected all of it. Um, there was uh, some carol singers out at the time of the fall, and uh, so they observed it. They just sort of stepped over it, basically. Luckily, none of them were hit. Um, so it was all quite a sort of um, relatively uh, disorganised affair by um, the standards of today, I would like to say. Um, but first I'll step back and say, so where do meteorites come from? I said they can come from anywhere, and they can indeed come from anywhere. Um, uh, but at the moment there's about uh, 67,000 known meteorites in collections across the world. And of those, all but about 300 or so, we think come from asteroids, or killer asteroids as Catherine calls them, <laughs> which I'm going to use now. Um, so, so nearly all of them we think are fragments of asteroids. Um, and um, so these are the ones that I mostly study because um, asteroidal meteorites uh, all um, have the same age dates, which you can measure by um, radioactive age measurements. They all date from about four and a half billion years ago, the, which is the time when our solar system formed. So they can tell us about what the environment was like at the time of our solar system's birth. Then the other two locations that we have meteorites from are... Uh, for sure, are the moon. Uh, and we can recognize their lunar meteorites because we have the Apollo samples and lunar samples and now the Chang'e 5 samples from China to compare them with. Uh, and they're very similar in, in all respects to, in many respects, to the samples that were brought back by space missions. Um, but um, lunar meteorites um, sample the whole globe of the moon. So the sample return missions to the moon always focused on the near side and the equatorial region of the moon, which is the easiest um, part to, um, to sample, uh, whereas uh, lunar meteorites can come from the surface of the moon, so they give us a better idea of the um, global heterogeneity of, of the moon, which can help inform us about its, its evolution. And then the third place, of course, is Mars. So we have a handful of meteorites that come from the planet Mars. At the moment, we don't have any sample return missions from Mars, so they're the only samples we have um, from, from another planet. Uh, but they're used a lot to ground truth uh, a lot of the Mars mission um, work. Uh, right, so we might have meteorites from other places. We might have meteorites from comets, or Venus, or, or Mercury, or the moons of the giant planets. But we know much less about those kinds of objects, so it could be that we just don't recognise them in our collections. Um, and it could also be that they're much less likely to come to Earth. So we think we get samples of the Moon and Mars because an asteroid will smash into their surface and chip a bit off, which then flings down and eventually falls to Earth. Uh, and that's going to be much harder for, um, certainly for planets that are closer to the Sun than us. Okay. So... Um, I mentioned that we can use meteorites to learn about solar system formation, and um, it's 
been really interesting over the course of my career to see how different disciplines can come together to kind of learn about this. There are different ways we can learn about solar system formation. So firstly, observations of planet formation around other stars. So we can use telescopes, um, and so both ground-based and, and um, space-based, to look at how um, stars have disks around them that, that might be planet-forming environments and then um, how these disks can form into planets uh, eventually. And so the observations of, um, of planets has, is something that is uh, of planet formation is something that is really, really growing as a field over the last few years especially. Um, so we can use meteorites as well. So whereas observations are telling us how um, other planetary systems are forming today, Meteorites tell us how our solar system formed four and a half billion years ago. And um, one of the things we can do is compare and contrast. So it could be that the galaxy is uh, evolving and, um, and that there are slight differences from what's happening today and what happened in our solar system formation. And then computer simulations of the planet forming process. That's another thing that's really, really grown uh, over the last uh, couple of decades especially and that now we can make simulations that are in several dimensions and are much, much more sophisticated um, than they, they used to be. And then finally, uh, we can use uh, space missions to visit ancient asteroids. So uh, we mentioned in the introduction that I'm involved in, in two asteroid uh, return missions. One I'll say a little bit about because it's already landed on Earth, Hayabusa 2. Uh, there's another one, Osiris-Rex, that's still in flight. And then in 2020, uh, yeah, 2024, the MMX space mission will launch, which is going to retrieve a piece of uh, Phobos. And um, yeah, Phobos, that, that's a completely different talk, which I won't get, get into too much, but maybe I can come back and give you a talk about that sometime. But Phobos is really interesting because it used to be thought that that was a piece of an asteroid. And that's why I got involved in the mission was because um, it's basically another asteroid sample return. But but more recent work suggests that it might actually have formed as a result of an impact uh, into Mars, and it might have formed in a kind of similar way to our moon formed by a giant impact that, that sprayed material out that condensed to form a moon. And we don't really know how Phobos formed, but having the sample back will tell us for sure. Okay, so four and a half billion years ago, our solar system looked something like this, had a young star at the center, it was surrounded by a disk that was made up of dust and gas. Uh, and the bits of dust uh, gradually coalesced into larger and larger um, objects, uh, and then eventually into asteroidal sized objects. And then once they're above a kilometer or so, they would start to be gravitationally attracted to each other. And then you get a state of runaway growth where, where planet formation happens quite easily from there. And one of the reasons we know this is by looking at meteorites. So if we look at the um, most common kind of meteorite, it's called a chondrite. And these are basically um, just consolidated pieces of that protoplanetary disk. Uh, and if you look at them close up, they are uh, made up of lots of little, kind of little bits and blobs. Um, the most common kind of blob is uh, these uh, darker-sized rounded ones, which are called chondrules. And uh, these formed by some very high temperature events in the early solar system. They could have formed by, they could have had the heat from impacts or by shock waves. But whatever the case, they, they formed um, at such high temperatures that the, these little globules of, of dust melted to form molten little silicate balls that were free floating in the solar system. Uh, and then the other kind of things of note are these white blobs that uh, I think look a little bit like bird poo, but they actually stand for calcium aluminium rich inclusions and they're actually made of ceramic minerals that, very, that form at very, very high temperatures. Uh, and the age dates of CAIs are the oldest um, dated solids that have ever been measured by radiometric dating. So they uh, have been very precisely age dated. They all have the same age, which is 4.567 billion years. And this is considered kind of time zero of the formation of solid material in our solar system. So that's just a kind of introduction to meteorites. Now I'm going to go on to tell you about what happened um, earlier this year. Uh, okay, there we go. Uh, so this is the 28th of February 
2021. It was just before 10 o'clock. Uh, and there was a huge fireball in the sky. I don't know, did any of you see it? It was actually visible over much of England and uh, Wales. Um, but it was during the national lockdown, so not many people were out, unfortunately. Um, so this was observed by uh, over a thousand eyewitnesses who saw it, and it was also uh, recorded on webcams, on doorbell cams, um, and um, kind of most importantly for us, it was recorded by several meteor cameras. So um, over the last probably 10 years, there are several groups that have set up cameras pointing upwards at the sky specifically to capture events like this. Um, and because we had dozens of data from these meteor cameras, we were able to work out exactly the trajectory of this fireball. Um, so we knew that it was coming in from uh, the west over Wales to the east. Uh, and so it was a fireball up to this point, and then it goes into what's called dark flight. So then it stops um, luminescing, and it just drops. And so we knew the, the um, full site would be somewhere in this area, which is just east of Gloucester. Um, so all of this happened kind of overnight, basically, on the 28th of February. Uh, all of the meteor groups were talking to each other and trying to get more and more kind of sophisticated models for where it might have fallen. So this was, uh, you know, so immediately, although... We, we see you know, a few fireballs a year. This was, this was noted as something of particular interest because um, the fireball was actually moving relatively slowly, which means that it's more likely to have um, a meteorite land on the ground. So we were immediately hopeful that um, a meteorite would be found. Um, and uh, this is a close-up of the area, and it has this town called Winchcombe, which is um, in Gloucestershire in the middle of, of the... Uh, expected area. So my, my colleague at the museum, Ashley King, actually went on, um, did a kind of bit of a media blitz. We contacted all the journalists that we knew, uh, particularly local news stations around uh, the west of England, and, um, uh, and he went on Breakfast TV and told everyone to look out for a meteorite. Uh, and we got kind of hundreds of photographs of some of the weirdest things people <laughs> sent us photographs of. Um, yeah, and, and nearly all of them, of course, weren't meteorites. Um, but um, we got this photograph, and we sort of scratched our head about it because, um, yeah, normally meteorites do kind of land as a rock. They don't sort of land as a pile of rubble. But it was right in the middle of the extreme field, expected extreme field, and um, yeah, and we thought, yeah, may maybe, maybe. So um, my colleagues uh, went over there to take a look. Uh, so the first person on site was a colleague called Richard Greenwood, who works at the Open University, just because he lives nearby. So he went over, and this was the kind of first photos that he took, and. Uh, any meteorite person would know immediately looking at that, that is definitely a meteorite. Uh, and you can tell because on the right hand side uh, image, you can see it has this crust with kind of cracks in it, which is very, very distinctive. This is called a fusion crust, and it forms when the um, meteor comes through the atmosphere, the outside of it melts. Um, most of the heat. Uh, uh, it, uh, most of the heat goes into material ablating away. Um, and it just leaves this very, very thin skin of, of uh, solid molten material on the, on the exterior. But the interior remains cold. Um, so we could see straight away, one, it's a meteorite. Two, it's a really uh, unusual kind of meteorite called a carbonaceous chondrite. So these are black meteorites. Meteorites are normally kind of much paler in color, pale gray in color. Um, so he um, um, phoned uh, me and Ashley. And uh, he told us, Ashley um, went straight over to, to Winchcombe. And it was a very, very strange time. So this, this is the church in Winchcombe, which kind of dominates the town. Don't know if any of you have been there. It's a beautiful town. Um, and uh, yeah, but it was all very, very odd because there was a lockdown at the time. The 
town was like a ghost town, basically. None of the shops were open. There was nobody on the streets. Um, so uh, Richard waited around in the cold um, for Ashley to arrive. And Ashley got there in the evening. And um, the uh, family whose driveway the meteorite had landed on, the Wilcox family, very kindly, obviously they, they weren't allowed to let them into the house because of the lockdown. Uh, but <laughs> they set up his little table and put the lights on in their living room so that uh, Richard and Ashley could do their work, go through all of the pieces. Um, right, and then, uh, yeah, this is... Ashley went and found a hotel room in, in Cheltenham, had a bottle of champagne <laughs> with... Almost, but not by himself. There was uh, one of our other colleagues, Natasha, came to join him at that point. Uh, the next day, I went out there to visit the family. So, honestly, this meteorite couldn't have landed on a nicer family's driveway. The Wilcox family have been absolutely brilliant from the beginning. Uh, and I think neither them nor, nor us knew what was going to happen next. Um, because we sort of, I remember sort of saying to them, you know, there might be, you know, maybe the press might be interested. Are you okay with that? And, um, and they were like, mm, don't know, well, maybe, or oh, yeah, right, whatever. Anyway, the press went mental, and uh, it was all, all over the TV and the news. Uh, this is actually a, the first recovered meteorite in the UK since 1990. So it was a really, I mean, it was a really, really big event for us. I mean, for, for, for me, it was amazing. So the meteorite that landed in 1990, I was a PhD student at the time. Uh, I remember the excitement then. It was, that meteorite was much smaller and it was a much less special type of meteorite. It was an ordinary chondrite. And, um, and I've been waiting all my career, basically, for another meteorite to land. And, and finally it did. And not only did it land, but it's, it was a really amazing type of meteorite. And uh, yeah, so it was, it was a really unbelievably special experience for me. Um, and yeah, I'm surprised that everyone else sort of found it as exciting as, as I did, including the family. So this is, uh, uh, that, that's me, that's uh, Catherine, uh, Hannah, and Rob Wilcock. Um, so they weren't the only ones, and again, and this is the smudge in the drive. This was after we'd collected most of the material. Uh, they weren't the only ones who had a meteorite land on, on their property, actually. There were a few others. Uh, so this is another couple. This, so this is uh, Dave and Val Carrick. And they lived a couple of miles, um, a couple of miles west in a in a little village called Woodmancote, and uh, they were actually looking in their garden. So they they've had a terrible problem with um, a local cat pooing in their garden, <laughs> and the day before the the 28th of, of February, um, Val um, had stepped in cat poo, and and traipsed it into the house. Um, Dave was furious with her and said, like, honestly, you know, just saying, you know, we've got to check the garden. You've got to be, you know, we've all got to be much more careful. So the morning of the 1st of March, they went out in their garden looking for little black bits of cat poo, uh, which they didn't find, but they did find this beautiful little meteorite. Uh, and there are about half a dozen other locations, uh, basically along a very straight line um, from, I don't know if you know this area, but from Bishop's Cleave to to Winchcombe. It's about uh, uh, an uh, area about eight kilometers across, going, uh, going west to east. OK, so a few residents uh, reported finding meteorites in their garden. And, and we knew there would be more out there, because we knew that it had fallen as a shower of stones. So it, it just, uh, this meteorite is so, it's very, as you could see from the, from the driveway, it's very, very friable. It wasn't really like a um, hard rock. It was very, 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 um, very poorly consolidated, we say, so it's like not, not really kind of very much stuck together at all. And when it was in the atmosphere, it had, had just kind of broken apart. So we knew there were other bits out there. Uh, and so the next day, all of the kind of meteoriticists from the UK kind of converged like wizards to a Quidditch tournament on the area of Winchcombe. Um, and um, this, uh, th this photograph, we, we call it the proposal photograph. So it looks like a proposal. Actually, it's not. This is uh, Ashley uh, showing uh, one of our colleagues what the meteorite looked like. Uh, so we met at this um, 
golf club car park in um, Bishop's Cleeve. And, uh, and about 20 of us went out searching the local fields to see what else we could find. Um, so this is a photograph of the search. So it looks a bit like a kind of police um, kind of forensic search. But basically, we're trying to keep about 10 metres apart from each other and sweep up and down systematically so we could um, uh, find, you know, mo click up, tick off which areas had been searched one by one. Uh, you know, luckily it didn't rain, so it was cold, but it was, the weather was fine. Um, and um, this searching went on for about five days. I'd actually gone home by then. But um, about five days afterwards, uh, success. So um, uh, Mira Ihaz, who's actually not a scientist, but she was a partner of um, one of the members of the Glasgow team, came across this beauty in a sheep's field. Um, yeah, and it really is a matter of kind of kissing a thousand frogs before you find your prince, because obviously if you're searching sheep fields and cow fields, <laughs> you're going to find all sorts of black things lurking in the grass, which you, you have to kind of look carefully at each one. And most, most of them are not meteorites. Um, but this one was. So this is actually the biggest single intact stone. It's about 150 grams. Um, so that was collected. Um, and then all of the material was taken back to the Natural History Museum. This is my uh, colleague, Helena, who's, um, who's the uh, interim curator of meteorites. And she was carrying it all in a paper bag, um, putting it all on the side. So these are all the bits that the Wilcox family collected. So the Wilcox family actually um, picked up all the material from their driveway uh, at about 9 a.m. the following morning after the fall. So it was only 12 hours after the fall, which is another special thing about this meteorite because it's actually the quickest collected carbonaceous chondrite ever. So it's potentially, and which is very important for these kind of meteorites because they immediately start to react um, with the Earth's atmosphere, they immediately start getting all sort of bugs and stuff on them. Um, so collecting them really quickly is actually essential. Uh, yeah, and they were absolute legends. They collected everything in uh, yeah, essential waitrose freezer bags and uh, yogurt pots, uh, got it all up. And uh, then the curation began. So these are our two curators going through the material. Um, so, and that's Ashley having a look at the big bit from the field. Uh, and then this was uh, after about a, a day of work, they got this far. So all of that bid kind of splapped in the driveway. Uh, they'd picked through and they'd weighed all the pieces that were larger than about um, 0.1 grams and put them in their own pots with the, with the weights on them. Um, and then, then the, the more kind of dusty material was just left in, in bags. Um, yeah, so we also have preserved for posterity the uh, pots that were collected, and then the bits of the um, dust on the driveway were collected with this, actually my son's toothbrush and um, paintbrush. So these were used to, to get up the very last little bit, fine bits. And uh, so, yeah, I'm quite proud that my son's toothbrush is now part of the National Meteorite Collection. <laughs> <laughs> right, this is what it looks like, this beautiful beauty. Um, and um, yeah, so it looks very, very dark, very black, um, and it's, it does have some white speckles on it, which we thought might be CAIs. It turns out they're not, uh, mostly. But um, then we started the analysis. So this is um, about to put it in uh, the instrument behind me there. It's called scanning electron microscope. So a beam of electrons uh, goes down a column here and then they are reflected off the sample, which is here, uh, which gives an image which is um, better resolution than you can get using an optical microscope. Uh, and also, the, um, the interaction of the electron beam with the sample um, gives off uh, x-rays, which are characteristic of um, the element that, that uh, the, uh, the electron's hitting. So it also gives us some idea of the composition. OK, so this is what it looked like uh, inside the uh, scanning electron microscope. You can see it has lots of blobs in it. So these are chondrules. You see it has loads of chondrules. It's got a blob here, which looks a little bit different. Um, and we go to the uh, element map. 
Uh, you can see it contains lots of calcium rich things, which are carbonates, the, the calcite. Uh, it mostly has this kind of iron rich matrix, which is all phyllosilicate, which is a mud. It's made of mud. It's got loads and loads of water kind of trapped in it. Um, and um, uh, yep, and this next one shows um, that it contains yeah, chondrules. And this object here turned out to be a CAI. But it's very, very much changed because it, the, the uh, meteorite has got so much water. This is water that it had from its indigenous asteroid. has so much water in it that, um, that it kind of has changed all of the chondrules and CAIs and turned them all into different kinds of mud. Uh, yeah, and it has different, uh, kind of basically different kinds of rocks within one rock. So this, this one looks a bit different. You see it's got more red sparkles. And what that suggests is that it might be from, we think it's from the surface of an asteroid uh, where um, the many li tiny little impacts that the asteroid surfaces get means that everything gets guarded and it gets all muddled, jumbled up, so you end up with uh, lots of different kinds of rocks jumbled up together. Um, so also we found uh, blobs of carbon-rich material. So that here green is in carbon. Yeah, sorry, green is carbon. Um, and uh, this is quite typical of this kind of meteorites that they can contain uh, blobs of carbon, which is in the form of organic molecules. And these, these uh, organics can actually be quite complicated. They can contain amino acids and sugars and alcohols. Uh, so this is something that we're characterizing at the moment. And again, the fact that this meteorite was collected so quickly is an absolute bonus because in meteorite science, it's always an issue um, that you don't really know whether the, the organic material that you're measuring is indigenous or whether it's a contaminant. But in this meteorite, because it's so fresh, we know that it is indigenous. Um, so as well as looking kind of close up down the microscope, our colleagues um, who worked with the meteor data were also busy at work. And um, this was uh, basically the result. What they can do is not only from looking at the trajectory, they can look where it was going, but they can also backtrack where it came from and can calculate its original orbit that it was in. Uh, and it turns out that it came from the outermost part of the asteroid belt, so it's definitely a piece of an asteroid, um, actually quite far out in the outermost parts towards Jupiter. So it's a really kind of, um, it's really great to know uh, exactly where it came from. Uh, and so in some respects, this sample is getting, it's not quite as good as having a sample return mission, but it almost is because we know where it came from. It was collected really quickly before it could get contaminated. Um, and um, yeah, and so it's, it's lovely. And uh, just to explain a little bit about why we're so excited about it. Um, so of, there are a few more known meteorites now, but um, uh, earlier this year, there were 65,000 known ones, and of those, only about 5% are of this type carbonaceous that contain organic material. And carbonaceous chondrites are, are we're, we're particularly interested in because they contain organics and they also contain loads of water. Uh, and we think impact of, of meteorites like that onto the early Earth is, is how we got to become a habitable planet. It was because uh, the Earth itself would have been very hot when it formed, but as it cooled down, it got impacted, pummeled by meteorites like the Winchcombe meteorite, and that eventually brought all of the water and carbon and other volatiles that we needed to form oceans and form life. So carbonaceous chondrites are really interesting. Um, yeah, and of those carbonaceous chondrites, only a tiny proportion, only a couple of percent, were actually seen to fall. The rest of them were found by um, by field work, going to Antarctica, for example, or hot deserts, actually going out searching for meteorites. Um, but the four meteorites are likely to be much less contaminated, so they're much more important. And of those falls, only, there are only four that have known orbits. Um, so this is just an amazingly special meteorite for, for UK science. Okay. And then just to, to uh, compare a little bit to to space missions. So these are images from the Hayabusa 2 space mission, which visited uh, this asteroid called Rugu, which is called a C-type asteroid. 
Uh, and there was always a suspicion that, so C-type asteroids look dark, they look black, and there was a suspicion that they were probably linked to carbonaceous chondrites, but that wasn't really established. Um, but one of the aims of this mission was to see if that was true. Um, so it went, it collected a bit from the surface of the asteroid, um, and then this is an image of it coming back down to Earth. It landed in uh, Western Australia, uh, and this is one of the team members finding the little capsule and picking it up. Um, and they brought back about four grams of material. Uh, so this is a comparison, asteroid Rugu, which can be trite. And you can see they look very, very similar. Um, yeah, Winchcombe's got bits of grass in it, but um, which obviously sample return mission doesn't have. Um, but they're both dark. So yeah, first glance, they're very similar. And uh, our initial analyses suggest that they, they're not identical. Um, so the uh, description of this uh, asteroid Rugu material is just being prepared now for publication in Science, as, they are, as is our Winchcombe meteorite, actually. Um, they're slightly different. The asteroidal material is um, uh, used to have, probably used to have more water in it, but has been de undergone some dehydration process while it was in space, uh, and the Winchcombe meteorite hasn't undergone that process. So there are differences, but they're, they're broadly similar. They contain organic material and um, all of the all this very similar minerals. Uh, then looking ahead, the next mission uh, is, uh, that I'm involved in is called OSIRIS-REx. Uh, this is visiting another asteroid called, called Bennu, which is also, uh, it's a subtype of C-type called B-type. Again, very, very dark black asteroid. Um, it uh, collected material uh, last year. Uh, this is a picture of its little arm going out to collect material. So it's, it's kind of a reverse vacuum cleaner that it spurted nitrogen gas out, which um, made the rubble on the surface kind of move around uh, and then get sucked into the uh, collector. And this was an image of the collector after it had done the collection. Uh, and by doing unbelievably comp uh, detailed analysis of this image, the um, mission team for Osiris Rex can see that, they, that it's got, um, I don't know, tens of grams, maybe hundreds of grams of material that's going to bring back to Earth in 2023. Uh, so it's going to be super interesting to compare this mission to Winchcombe. And I think there's, there's going to be some similarities in the fact, so we collected altogether about 600 grams of Winchcombe uh, meteorites, and I think probably about the same amount will be brought back by Osiris Rex, so it would be quite Interesting to be able to compare these two. Okay, Winchcombe now is at our museum. Uh, have, have any of you been to Natural History Museum? Yay! Have any of you seen Winchcombe there? Yay! <laughs> right. right, it's at the end of this gallery, our minerals gallery. So here we have uh, the Wilcox family, and on the left is Victoria Bond, who's the landowner of the uh, sample that was found in the field, and all of them amazingly kindly donated their samples to us at the museum um, so we will be able to use them for generations to come uh, so this is what it looks like on display and uh, <clears throat> the the very kind of the final piece of the story that i have to tell you is um the other thing that has happened is that actually the driveway has also been collected um, so this only only happened in September this year. Um, there's a very, very tiny little um, divot in the, in the tarmac of the driveway. It's only about kind of this, this big, but there's a little dent in it, and there's still a lot of kind of black um, dust um, that, that we couldn't get up. Um, so the Wilcox family, su again, super kindly, uh, offered to donate their driveway as long as we made it good afterwards. Uh, and so we've removed about a metre squared piece um, of the driveway, which is now sitting in the corridor outside my office. To be honest, not quite sure what to do with it because it's maybe a bit big to go on display, but eventually we will put it on display because it's, really, it's a really nice story, I think. And, uh, yeah, one of the nice things about meteorites is that, um, you know, some, it, it's, it's very accessible astronomy. It's something so, someone can understand, so... Um, you know, it's a good, I think it's a good pathway into telling people about the formation of stars and planets if, uh, because everyone can understand 
a rock smashing into a driveway. That's, that's a very, very easy concept for everyone to get. So I really hope that we can get it on display and tell everybody this, uh, the story of this meteorite. Um, yeah, so thank you very much for listening. I'm very happy to take any questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sarah. Thank you. Any questions from the floor? Yes, in the front here. Um, may I ask if, obviously, um, just recently there have actually been several other fireballs um, seen, not necessarily with any material landing, but is there a protocol to follow if, similar to this landing, we knew and found the piece? Yes. Is there a particular protocol that should be followed to not contaminate it? Right. That's a great question. Thank you. Yeah, and I should have said that. So, um, yeah. So, I do. Um, yeah. So, so getting it off the ground is is the the key thing. So, you know, don't wait till you have the perfect sterile tools or whatever. Just get it. If you get it up as as the Wilcoxes did, just in a plastic bag, it's fine. I suggest like doing it like you'd pick up dog poo. Don't touch it with your hand. Just put your hand over it with a bag and pick it up. That would be fantastic. You can also collect it in foil as well. It's also fine. Um, I've seen several of those pictures. Tin foil seems to be in there. Yes, that yes. Contaminated. Yes, so it depends, you see. There's no, there's no ideal thing. So our colleagues who study organics are, to be honest, they're not keen on plastic bags because then they, well, they analyse a bit of plastic bag and then they have to subtract that from all of their data. Um, so they don't love plastic bags. But then people who study... Um, Iron are not keen on, on foil either. Well, yeah, so th there's no ideal thing, but collect it how you, how you like, but try not to put your hand on it. Do try and collect it before it rains if you can. Rain is just terrible for meteorites. Um, yeah, and contact UK Fall is kind of um, our, the consortium that's, that deals with these. But yeah, there have been several fireballs, and we're really hopeful, although we've had to wait for 30 years to have a UK meteorite. We won't have to wait another 30 years because now we have, we have the meteor cameras and we also have you know, much better ways of communicating. If people do see a fireball, they can report it. And um, so hopefully, hopefully it won't be that long before the next one. If you move a bit to the right, uh, Sarah, yeah. that, then uh, we can both, we're, then we're both on camera. I right. can I ask you that uh, John Merrill, uh, watching on YouTube, has uh, asked, does the isotopic ratio of the water in the Winchcombe Fall tell us anything new? Yeah, uh, yes. Um, so the iso isotopic water composition of water has been measured by a team at the uh, University of Glasgow. Um, and it's been a really uh, important measurement to make because water is also one of those things that is very easily contaminated in meteorites and is often... Uh, we, we're often concerned that the, that the DH ratio that you measure in meteorites is not its indigenous value, but it's been affected by, by water. Um, it's, um, the values for Winchcombe are not that different to similar other very fresh carbonaceous chondrites. So um, they're, they're fairly, I can't remember exactly the number to be honest, but that they are fairly similar to the bulk value of the Earth, which is different to the value that we see in comets, which are much more enriched in deuterium generally. So, um, it's, so that's part of the reason that we think that, that meteorites like Winchcombe provided the water that we have on Earth, because it has a similar isotopic composition of its water. And Daryl Dobbs asks, how much material do you think you recovered compared to how much actually Ooh. reached the ground? Oh, that's okay, that's a really good question too. So we've recovered just over 600 grams, and the um, people that study the fireball predict that about, about that much fell. So we think that we've, we've just about got it all. But, you know, because a lot of these samples were found fortuitously, you know, I wonder if there's more out there, but um, yeah. Any other questions? Is, uh, I'll take the one at the front here. Uh, oh, front. Um, I understand that this meteorite is similar to Murchison. And in Murchison they found pre-solar grains. Yeah. Any evidence of those in this one yet? Yep, we, ha we haven't done that analysis yet, but, but yeah, we absolutely will do. And yeah, I, I very much expect that there will be, because yeah, it's the, same, it's the same class, exactly the same class as Murchison. Mary had a question.
Great. Yeah. Well, I don't know. One of my my kind of opposite number at Smithsonian Washington said we should write a book, or we should have like a book of funny meteor wrongs because some of them are so funny. I guess the most memorable one for me was um, also when I was, I was a student at the Open University in Milton Keynes, and we got a phone call from a fairly rough estate who said um, that they'd had a meteorite fall come through their window. And we went out to look at it, and it turned out to be very clearly half a brick. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, <laughs> we, so we had to try and explain <laughs> to them that that's think, what it was. I think there's a question right at the back. Take, take the microphone up there, um, Alan. That's Howard. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Um, yes. I, th I mean, I, you did cover this at the beginning. I didn't quite, maybe I, either I wasn't listening or whatever. Anyway, um, what I, my question is this. You, you were saying that chondrites are formed in the very early universe. You know, they kind of coalesce out of the, uh, you know, like soup of material. So the question is, does that mean um, in the early, sorry, did I say universe, early solar system, does that mean in the, in the early solar system there were lots of chondrites, all different sizes, some were big, some were a bit smaller? And uh, so is it a case of, say, a chondrite forms and it's, you know, say it's three inches across. Once it's formed, once it's three inches, it stays like that forever. Uh, and also, is it a case of um, if, if, if material coalesces to a sufficient degree, it then becomes an asteroid? I and mean, at what point does it become an asteroid and not a meteorite? Right. Yeah, I'm not sure that I followed the beginning of your question, but, but that's right. So it, that these meteorites are frozen relic from the beginning of the solar system. And the idea is that they, they were always on a small body, kind of with a size of up to about 100 kilometers or so. And we know it can't have been any bigger than that, because if it was bigger than that, then it would start to heat up and it would change. But actually, the sort of magical thing about these chondrites is that they've basically been deep frozen since four and a half billion years ago. So they do give us this insight into what the protoplanetary disk looked like. Um, yeah, and so, sorry, what was the second part? The other? I mean, the, yeah, it's effectively the same question. So what I'm, what I'm asking is, I mean, the, right, this, this, this chondrite that landed in the Winch Winchcombe, was it a fra would it have been a fragment or something bigger, yes. or was, oh, it, yeah. was it always that size? Sorry, yes, yes, I should have made that clearer. Yes, it would have been a fragment of something bigger, for sure. It, yeah, it wouldn't have survived, uh, yeah, it was probably only about um, half a metre across when it came into the, into the atmosphere, which is uh, of a size it wouldn't have survived for four and a half billion years that small. It would have, it would have fallen into the, the sun. It needs, it would have been... A, an object, yeah, bigger. It's maybe, but we don't know how big exactly, but from a kilometre size to tens of kilometre size. In, in, in which case, uh, in which case, how does, it, how does a bit fall off? Does it just fall off? <laughs> <laughs> no, it would, have, it would have fallen off when uh, during an impact. Ah, so the, right. so the yeah. asteroid belt is, is a, still fairly, a fairly chaotic place. The, um, the rest of the solar system has been swept out. So if there's a planet around, it kind of will sweep lots of little objects in its path. And, uh, but the, in the asteroid belt, there's a lot of small bodies and they, they impact each other fairly often. And so it would have been a chip from one of these impacts that yeah, fell right. to oh, okay. Earth. Yeah, so it is not. So basically what, what you've just said is it's not a question of um, a meteorite uh, um, an object might form, let's say, three inches across, and it's always been three inches no. across. It's not, it's, yeah, okay, right. No, a slight, a slight disappointing. <laughs> right, <sorry. laughs> I just love the idea of this thing that's been three inches across for like billions of years. <laughs> yeah, no, okay, sorry. Yeah, yeah, it would have been part of a larger object. And yeah, okay. actually, one of the measurements we can do is uh, look at uh, how uh, cosmic rays have impacted on it, and that can tell us something about how big the body was that it came from and whether it was at the surface or, or not yeah, as well. Great. Oh, thanks, thanks a lot. Thank you. Well, we'll have to move on now. Okay, great. Thank you. So, thank you very much, Professor Sarah Rossi.
Our last talk for this afternoon is from of our, one of our regular contributors who hardly needs any introduction from me, Nick James, uh, director of our comments section. He's also a past paper secretary and has done many jobs within the BAA. Today, he is going to be giving us our sky notes, talking about what we have observed recently and what we can look forward to coming up in the next month or so. Nick. Thank you, David. <laughs> so who's, who's walked off with the slide clickery thing? Ah, <laughs> sorry, false accusation. Um, so just, just to keep your interest, this is the kind of last part of the Christmas meeting and the idea is it's a fairly kind of light-hearted end uh, to the meeting. So the last time I did one of these was two years ago, so it's great to be back in an auditorium with real people, it really is. And to keep your attention to the end, not giving away too much, there is some killer asteroid stuff at the end of this talk. <laughs> okay, so uh, we'll start, as we always do, with the sun. And in fact, this is a bit unfair. This is a picture of the sun from yesterday, which doesn't actually show very much in the way of activity on the surface. But the sun has been reasonably active lately. Any of you who've had a chance to get out there and have a look at the sun will have seen quite a few sunspot groups. At the moment, though, it's fairly quiet. Um, but one of the things that's been posted on the BAA members page, I think, is this. And I think these are great. So these are, these are pictures taken with a, a thing called a solar cam. So most of the time in astronomy, we try, you know, we're talking about Vera Rubin and how big that is. This is a pinhole camera. And the idea of this pinhole camera is you put some photographic paper in the, in the back of it that's not really very sensitive. And you expose it not for seconds, not for minutes, but for weeks or months, and then develop it. And you get a wonderful image. And this shows the path of the sun across the sky from the summer solstice, so it kind of being really high in the sky there, down to almost the winter solstice. But, oops. But uh, as Matt Williams says on his webpage, unfortunately, he didn't quite get to the winter solstice because Storm Arwen came along and uh, obviously dislodge the can. But these are really great. You can make them yourself if you want to, fairly easily. But if, if you're not much good at making things, you can go online, just search for solar can, and I think they're about 15 pounds, something like that. Great things just to stick up, leave for six months or so, and then develop and get an image like this, which I think is wonderful. Really, really shows how the sun moves across the sky through the year. So back to a bit more high-res stuff of the sun. This is hydrogen alpha, so it's showing a, a few um, uh, images of various active regions that there have been over the last few months. Uh, this one by Stuart Green, showing a lovely filament here in front of the, uh, the solar surface. Amazing resolution again, and amazing that uh, with modern imaging systems and amateur telescopes, we can get resolutions like this on the sun particularly when if you do actually observe the sun, you see what the seeing looks like most of the time during, a, during the daytime. Uh, just amazing that we can get images like this. And here's one where we've got filaments and prominences. So prominences on the, the edge of the sun here, and the filaments uh, showing up over the photosphere here. Um, again, in hydrogen alpha, so in, in monochromatic wavelengths. And of course, the sun affects us on Earth. And you'll know from my, uh, from my normal Christmas uh, meeting uh, talks, I tend to include uh, um, stuff from scientific journals, including the sun here. Um, and this is the sun doing its normal kind of slightly exaggerating. Another storm could hit the Earth on Friday, unleashing the northern lights and uh, power grid chaos. Well, we didn't have any power grid chaos, but we did have some good northern lights. This is a lovely picture from County Galway, actually by Ronan Newman over in Ireland, showing the aurora uh, fairly low down on the horizon. And then we've got a, this gorgeous image by Alan Tu from um, Moray in Scotland, showing uh, the aurora here. And then this kind of uh, vertical spiky stuff going up where you get into the red above the green below, so all of the different emission wavelengths in the atmosphere. So. Uh, one of the advantages of living up in northern Scotland is actually getting a chance to see these aurora. My, my friend Dennis Brzezinski, who lives up uh, in that, that part of the world, uh, is always complaining, well, sort of complaining about light pollution from the aurora, but he, he manages to do cometary astronomy and take pictures of the aurora at the same time. So another form of light pollution, of course, is this object. 
This is uh, our friend the moon. Uh, nice picture by Neil Webster there showing the waning gibbous moon. So we're all familiar with the waxing uh, phases of the moon, less familiar usually with the waning phases because they take place in the morning sky. But I always find them sort of more a more interesting view of the moon. And then James Dawson and Richard Seven here have, have done some kind of time machine stuff. So I was looking on the, the BAA members' pages and uh, some images of Hipparchus and Albategnius, the, the two craters there from uh, 2020, so about a year or so ago. And apparently they found uh, some video that they'd shot, an AVI that they'd shot whilst clearing out their computer disk, decided to process it and got this rather nice view of those craters. So the moon today, and we'll come to this in a minute, is new. So it was new this morning, precisely at 7.43, and something particularly important happened this morning at 7.43, which I guess most of you know about, but if you don't, you'll find out in a minute. It's um, ideal for observing the deep sky at the moment because it's out of the sky. It's now gonna start moving into the evening sky, and by December the 19th, it will be full. Um, and then it'll go through to being new again at the beginning of January. So there was a lunar eclipse. And here's another thing that the media do. I don't know whether you saw this. That there was recently a partial lunar eclipse. And for some reason, and this got real traction in the media, this thing that it was the longest near total lunar eclipse for nearly 600 years. Well, that sounds really exciting, doesn't it? Not really. The reason it was the longest near total eclipse for 600 years is that it was a very, very big partial. It was almost total. It just missed being total. So, and also the moon was at apogee as well, so moving a little bit more slowly. So the umbra took quite a while to cross the moon, but of course it would take even longer if it had been a total eclipse. So it's one of those wonderful misleading things you see in the media where they suddenly pick up on some record, like, you know, Mars is the closest it's been for 400 years or something, and it's closer by about 10 kilometres from the last opposition. <laughs> um, anyway, this was quite a, a, a difficult challenge for us in the UK, uh, particularly where I am, right in the very southeast of the UK, because the moon was setting just at the point that the umbral shadow hit uh, the lunar surface. So I, I went out and tried to uh, get some images of this, and this is actually some video I shot with the moon only about five degrees above the horizon. Um, and you can just about see the penumbral shadow here, just about at the top. But where I was in the southeast of England was just the wrong place, really. Um, we got some nicer images from up uh, in Scotland. So this is from John Owen up in Aberdeen, showing quite a large partial phase. But of course, the best views were actually over the US and also in the Southern Hemisphere, down in New Zealand and Australia. So we've got a nice image here from Morris Collins showing the uh, umbra crossing the moon, upside down, of course, because they're in the Southern Hemisphere, although that's, of course, fake to any flat, work, flat Earth people in the audience. Uh, uh, sort of the World Congress of Flat Earth people wouldn't really be able to cope with upside down moons. And we have uh, this, which is when it was almost near total. So it wasn't quite total, but uh, very close. And a really lovely picture here from Peter Anderson in Brisbane in Australia. So yes, today was new moon. It's also a total eclipse. And uh, it's quite unusual for me to be here at a BAA meeting on the day of a total eclipse, because I tend to chase after these things. But this one was really difficult to get to. It was only visible on land uh, over a small part of the Antarctic continent, which is both very difficult and very expensive to get to. Um, so most people actually were observing it from ships in around the Drake Passage in the Southern Ocean here. And the weather prospects were always going to be very dodgy for this eclipse. And a couple of my friends on the, one of the ships, the Astro Trails ship, uh, sent me some pictures. This is their picture of totality. They were enveloped in fog at the time, unfortunately. And the only good pictures I've seen from the surface of the Earth are from Union Glacier, which is a, a private camp on Antarctica that you can go to um, if you have the uh, appropriate funds to get there. Um, and this is actually a snapshot from the NASA TV feed this morning. 
So you can see there's a nice prominence there. It was a very short eclipse from the Union Glacier because they were quite a long way off the centre line and it was quite a short total eclipse anyway. But anyway, next one is April 2023. Um, and I was hoping to be in Australia for that, but I'm not sure they'll be letting us in by then, by the way things are going. Um, the, the COVID pandem pandemic is causing huge kind of problems to, for travel and particularly in Australia. So I have to wait and see how that goes. So now just going through the night sky. So starting off in the evening, at evening twilight, we've got three planets visible in evening twilight at the moment. So we've got uh, Venus very low down, and it's been pretty low down for the last few months or so as it's been moving away from the sun. It's at a very far southerly declination. We have Saturn here and Jupiter. So if you get out uh, and you have a nice clear evening twilight sky, um, you should be able to see those three planets low in the west. So Jupiter and Saturn are are gradually disappearing after having been around for a long time. Uh, Venus is now heading back very quickly to its inferior conjunction, which is uh, in January. And I had to show this. This is a picture by Patrick Sadowski. It's of uh, a mountain which I've climbed, although somebody in the audience might have a laugh at that. Um, it's uh, a mountain in Donegal called Eridal. And... Um, this mountain, being an Irish mountain, is surrounded by a peat bog. And the photographer somehow managed to get all of his camera gear and equipment up to the top of the mountain. It's taken this wonderful picture, and that's Jupiter and Saturn there. So this was in, back in September when they were a little bit higher up, but a lovely view of the galaxy. Um, so I thought that was an absolutely fantastic picture and just shows what lengths people will go to to take pictures of the night sky. Um, a slightly more mundane environment, this is a picture of, of the three planets in line by Richard Sargent, taken from Cheshire just uh, a few weeks ago. Uh, so you've got Jupiter there, Saturn, and then Venus low down. Venus has been very low down, so quite difficult to get decent resolution on, but these uh, pictures by Peter Tickner show it quite nicely uh, as the phase has gradually changed. And as I say, it's coming into inferior conjunction on January the 8th. So Venus is in the position in its orbit at the moment where it moves very rapidly through its phases as it's approaching us and heading to inferior conjunction. Um, so if you don't see it over the next few weeks, it will be gone and it will then appear in the morning sky. Of the other planets we've got, Jupiter um, has been around for a long time. It's quite, still quite southerly declination for us. So most of the best images of it are coming from further south in the UK. Uh, this one here from, I uh, uh, can't remember what the M's for, Manuel Rodriguez, I think, um, from Seville in Spain, showing a lot of detail on the surface. Uh, but this one from Peter Edwards in West Sussex, although that is pretty far south compared to those of us who live in Essex. Um, really nice, really nice view of Jupiter and its, uh, its satellites. And of course Saturn as well, uh, which is disappearing now. Um, and this was taken by Trevor Barry in Australia, where Saturn is really high up in the sky at the moment. So if we come round a bit more to kind of midnight at this time of the year, we've got all of the familiar winter constellations. So you've got Orion here, uh, you've got Sirius um, and Monoceros. So the, the really nice winter constellations with the Milky Way going up through Auriga. We've got Uranus, uh, very well positioned at the moment, just past opposition. And again, some nice images from Peter Tickner showing the, the disk of Uranus and potentially some details on the surface. And it's a really small planet, um, so very impressive to get, uh, to get good images of it. But you can certainly find it out. You ought to be able to find it fairly easily in binoculars if you know where to look. And it's always worth having a look at it in a telescope because it does look very different to the stars, and you can imagine what William Herschel thought when he came across this thing with his probably much more rudimentary telescope than the kind of telescopes that we have, and thought initially it was a comet, maybe, uh, but discovered it as a planet. So it's, it's always worth looking at these things to actually realise, you know, whether would you be able to discover this as a planet uh, if you didn't actually know it was there? Another thing that's worth looking at over the Christmas period 
is Betelgeuse, um, because Betelgeuse is a, oops, me, is a variable star, and about two years ago, it had quite a big dip in brightness. So this magnitude scale, just in case you can't read it, goes from 0.4 to 2. So it dropped by something like 1.6 magnitudes. It's now come back fairly stable again, but it's worth making estimates just with the naked eye when you go outside. So if you go on the BAA website, follow the links, you can find a, a chart that you can use for comparison magnitudes, and just do, do some estimates of Betelgeuse over the Christmas period. You can even do it, get friends and family outside and, and sort of uh, do it together and see if you can agree on the magnitudes. This actually is, may not look like it, a bit of video from a meteor camera. So meteor cameras have developed very rapidly and they're now really impressive in terms of what they can pick up in the sky. Um, so this is one of my meteor cameras. This is a camera that looks to the southeast. And if you look just about here in a minute, you'll see something brightening up and then disappearing. Uh, it should come, I think, soon. Can you see it? There's a, a thing there. Brightening up and then disappearing away. Has anyone got any ideas what that is? Yes, it's a geostationary satellite. And these geostationary satellites, um, at certain times, uh, reflect sunlight back from their solar panels to the Earth. And so they can become really bright. So most of the time, these geosats are about um, 11th or 12th magnitude. But that brightened up to second magnitude. And that happens quite a lot. There was a posting on the BAA forum a while back from Martin Nicholson, I think it was, of some pictures that were taken at Kelling, uh, which showed loads of these things flaring through the night. So I can certainly thoroughly recommend that people should, should look, look at getting Meteor cameras. There are actually there are lots of resources on the web now. Mary mentioned uh, the work that they're doing. Um, there's a network called Global Meteor Network which has these cameras, and then there are other UK networks, UK Mon and Nematode, and it's fascinating stuff. So not, even if you don't get meteors, you, you see loads of other things in the sky as well. And the quality is just brilliant uh, now, really, really good, and the costs are quite low, these cameras. You can buy them from, uh, from China, the cameras, for about 40 or 50 pounds, something like that. So definitely worth having a, a look at that. So uh, what we've got here, we've got Orion, we've got Gemini here, and just off the top is Taurus. And I was really taken by this wonderful image of the supernova remnant M1, the Crab Nebula, taken by Alan Halsey um, a few days ago, just showing again what amazing uh, detail we can get now with amateur telescopes and modern imaging systems. There have been lots of variable stars and transients and things going off in the sky. This is the latest one. This is a, a transient object that's appeared in the constellation of Aries, which is well placed for us at the moment. And Aries isn't normally a place you'd expect to get Novae or anything. And this is actually probably not a Nova. But it's, uh, it's another interesting variable object to follow. And this nice image here from Mazen Yunis, who's actually currently out in Morocco, uh, with his imaging equipment and taking some fantastic images and sending them into us. If we look behind us at midnight, we've got uh, the other side of the Milky Way, so going down through Cassiopeia into Cepheus and then down into Cygnus. And there are lots of interesting variable stars currently to observe. Some of them are still quite bright. So we've got two very dusty novae that have been around for a while. One of them in Cassiopeia, V1405 Cass, the other in Volpecula, V606 Volpecula. And these novae have quite bumpy light curves. So this scale here is from 6th um, to 7th to 8th to 9th to 10th magnitude. So quite large range here for, for this variable. And this one is still pretty bright, although it's, as you can see here, it's had a fade here. V1405 
B606 Val uh, is, is similar. It's had various bumps in its light curve, but then it's had a really dramatic fade, and it's currently down to about uh, approaching 19th magnitude, I think, or 18th magnitude. So it's faded quite a lot. So those are in Cassiopeia and Volpecula. We have a, another couple as well that have been around with us for a while, which, which look different to the previous ones, but have similar light curves. So V1112 Persei, you see, had a kind of sudden fall, and then it recovered a bit, and then it settled down. And then V1391 Cass had another of these rather chaotic light curves, then a very sudden fall, and then a recovery. So they're really interesting objects to observe. The, um, the bright one in Cass, this one, 1405, is next to the bubble nebula, so it's a nice imaging target, and it's bright enough, or has been bright enough, to see in binoculars, so definitely worth keeping an eye on. Uh, one other variable star that's really easy to observe is Chi Cygni. It's in Cygnus, so down here in, in Cygnus, easy to find. It's currently at its minimum, but brightening up, so worth following over the next few months as it brightens. So at the moment, it's down at about 12th magnitude, I think it is. Um, so you need a telescope to see it. But it actually gets bright enough that you can see it in binoculars. It gets up to about 5th or 6th magnitude. It's a Myra um, with a really nice light curve. So it's not just variable stars that vary in magnitude. We have comets too. And this particular one varies quite dramatically. This is comet 29P Schwachmann Backman, which is a huge centaur comet. It's probably maybe 60 kilometers across or so. It's in the orbit, uh, an orbit just outside Jupiter. So it's not in a normal kind of cometary orbit, which is elongated. It's in a circular orbit. And it's just gone past opposition. It's well placed for us high up in the sky at the moment. Um, so it's just gone, gone through Taurus. It's into Perseus at the moment. And that. <laughs> who's doing that? That's the on-screen pointer. So who's controlling the on-screen pointer? Maybe it's... It's a doppelganger. <laughs> Can you control it? Well, unless I'm doing it by power of thought. <laughs> anyway, um, yeah, it's, it's just, uh, just in Persis. It's very well placed for us at the moment. And it's a comet that um, has outbursts. And Dr. Richard Miles runs a project for the BAA called Mission 29P, which has encouraged people to observe this comet and look for these outbursts. So what these outbursts are are probably eruptions of what Richard calls cryovolcanoes. That's bizarre. Uh, Sorry, this is an arrow moving around on my screen here. Anyway, so these are eruptions of cryovolcanoes, and um, what we're seeing is material flowing out into the coma of the comet and then expanding away. And we ha have really good coverage from amateur observers now who observe these objects and look for outbursts and then measure the, the light curve. And this is a light curve that Richard's produced for this year, which just shows how many of these outbursts there are of this comet and Richard has a theory about why these occur. They occur synchronous with the rotation rate. It's a very slow rotating comet. And so it's probably one of these cryovolcanoes coming into sunlight as it rotates into daytime, then, then doing a big outburst. But we had a really big one um, at the end of September, which was a sequence of probably about four eruptions that all happened within a few days of each other to cause the comet to brighten from about 16th magnitude to... 11, something like that. So it brightened very dramatically. We have uh, a few other nice comets around at the moment. So this one, uh, which is the famous Rosetta comet, 67P cherimov gerasimenko has been um, around for a while. It shows really nice, a really nice tail. So this image here from Martin Mobley is a remote image of the comet, and you can see a nice coma as well. And it's been very well placed for us too. So it's been going, moving through Taurus, through Gemini. It's now in, in Cancer. But it's still a very accessible object. It's probably about eighth magnitude at the moment. Probably the second brightest comet there is in the sky. And of course, it's the comet that we know the most about. This is uh, the comet, the, the famous rubber duck comet. So this is 
one of the 3D models that was produced from Rosetta data showing the rotation of that nucleus. So this is the, the thing that causes everything that we see in Cheryumov Gerasimenko. So all of the coma and the, the tail comes from this nucleus. So when you look at that comet, and it's like many things in astronomy, you can look at something that maybe doesn't look that impressive, but you can think there's actually something that we designed and built, two things actually, the, the Rosetta spacecraft and the Phile lander, sitting on the surface of that cometary nucleus, which is a pretty awesome thing. So it's still worth going out and photographing. This is a, an image from, I think, Richard Sargent, yeah, um, taken the end of November. So it's, uh, it's currently uh, kind of around midnight or so. It's very, very high up, well, very well placed, this comet. So if you're interested in taking some images or going out and having a look at a, a very famous comet, take the opportunity to do that. As we come round into the dawn sky, so if you're up about sort of four or five o'clock in the morning, then we see the constellations of spring beginning to appear. So we've got Virgo here with all the galaxies in the bowl of Virgo, and we've got the bright star Arcturus. And um, this is where I'll start my kind of run through some of the entertaining media stuff that um, I've picked up through the years. So, one of, my, one of my kind of bugbears about the media is that they'll take, they'll take perfectly reasonable facts and they'll then sort of turn them into something that, uh, that, that gives completely the wrong impression. So this is a great headline. Mega Comet that's up to 300 miles wide will reach its closest approach to Earth in 2031, an event not seen for at least 500,000 years. So that sounds really impressive, doesn't it? Until you realise that the closest approach to the Earth that this comet is going to have is 11 astronomical units. So it's hardly in the killer asteroid category. But this is an interesting object. This is a, uh, um, uh, an asteroid stroke comet called 2014 UN271. It's a, it's a large centaur comet, probably the largest one that we know. And it is coming in towards perihelion in 2031, so that's correct. I'm not sure where they, they, they work out the 500,000 years stuff from, but we'll give them that. Then this one, I like this. The end is always nigh, and, and comets are often associated with the end of the world, but this is good. Scholar is convinced that the comet will herald an apocalypse after decoding Bible with one set to hurtle, hurtle is one of the words they use a lot, past the earth this Christmas. Well, which comet is hurtling past the Earth at the moment? I think they mean this one. So this is Comet 21A1 Leonard, which is the brightest comet in the sky at the moment. It's really definitely worth getting up for, but you will have to get up early in the morning because it's at its best about 5 a.m., 5 to 6 o'clock in the morning, just before it gets light. It's currently just passed over the globular cluster M3. So it's currently here, just on the borders of Coma and Bootes. It will scoot north of Arcturus over the next few days, and then it dives south into Serpens, and we'll probably lose it probably December the 11th, December the 12th. So you've got about a week to see this comet. And it's a, it's a comet that's, that's actually Definitely worth going and looking for. You, you will probably see it in binoculars. It's currently about magnitude 6.5. It'll probably brighten maybe by another two magnitudes. Um, its geometry is such that we might, it might brighten even by more than that because it's moving uh, between us and the, the sun. So we might get some forward scattering from dust in its tail. Um, this is an image I took of it the other day when there was some stuff on the internet about it potentially disintegrating, but it's not. It's got a very nice compact head, nice tail, nothing too much bad going on with it. In terms of uh, colour images, this is a really nice one from David Strange. And this light curve Jonathan Shanklin's put together. So we're currently about here, and it'll probably go up to something like fourth magnitude or so at its brightest, which is just as we'll be losing it. So do try and get it over the next couple of weeks. Mazen Yunus again produced this really nice image of it. Um, this was from Morocco again, from Adar village in Morocco. Uh, Robin Ledbetter's even done a spectrum of it, which is quite impressive uh, because the comet isn't really that bright, you know, sixth magnitude, something like that. But showing all the, the normal carbon species, 
uh, in the coma in the tail of the comet. And of course, yesterday, uh, it was passing by the globular cluster M3, uh, which was a real kind of event to look forward to. Um, and of course, in the UK, it was cloudy, uh, which was a real shame. But various people managed to get images of it. This is from Peter Carson. This is from his remote observatory in Spain, a really nice movie showing it moving past the globular cluster. And it is moving very fast at the moment in the sky. It's moving, I think, about seven arc seconds a minute, I think, is the current rate. Um, this, though, is a gorgeous image from Ian Sharp of the comet sort of direct hit on M3. So you've got, you've got the lovely coma here. You've got the tail going back across the sky. So, unfortunately, um, we didn't get to see that from the UK, but there's still lots of opportunity to see this comet. It'll be the brightest one that we've had this year, so definitely worth getting out in the morning skies and, and having a look. You'll need binoculars to find it, probably, uh, but you should be able to find it. Just, uh, just make sure you know where to look before you go out. So I promised you some killer asteroids, and here's one. This is good, huge asteroid, twice the size of Big Ben. So you'll know that one of my other pet peeves is I hate it when people don't actually tell you how big something is. They tell you how big it is in terms of stuff that you don't really know how big it is. Because how big is Big Ben? It's a bell, that's right. Is it the, but did they mean that? Who knows? Anyway, it's set to crash into Earth's orbit on Monday. What does that mean? No idea. Um, anyway, so this is actually... Uh, an object that is passing the Earth at the moment, 1994 WR12. Um, in some further non-sensational reporting, we've got this one. Huge 430-foot asteroid is set to fly through the Earth's orbit on Monday. Here is how to spot it. Well, there you go. You can't miss it, can you? <laughs> Artist's impression of the shattered remains of an asteroid located 150 light years away from the Earth. <laughs> so even when they do use units... God knows. Anyway, so this is indeed a killer asteroid, or would be a killer asteroid. I mean, 430 foot across is definitely killer asteroid territory, crashing into the Earth's orbit. A bit disappointing when you actually get to the boring stuff of looking at the ephemeris. This is from JPL Horizons. This is the object. It's actually quite observable for us at the moment. It's in Auriga, going through Perseus and Andromeda. But if you have a look at the closest approach to the Earth, which is about here... This is an astronomical unit. It's 0.04 astronomical units. So 0.04 times 150 is what? About six or seven million kilometres or something. So I don't think it's quite in killer asteroid territory yet. But if you want to have a look at a killer asteroid, uh, go to JPL Horizons, look it up, and uh, you'll, you'll actually be able to image this one. It gets to be about 16th magnitude. So again, probably not the sort of thing that the average reader of the sun is going to be able to find going out in the morning. Um, we've got a couple of good meteor showers coming up. The best one of the year, which is the Geminids, is coming up on the night of the 13th, 14th of December. Um, the maximum is about sometime in the morning on the 14th. Unfortunately, the, the, the moon is not ideal. It's, uh, it's a few days after first quarter. So the moon's going to be a bit of a problem for the Geminids. Oh, look, there's one. Um, the moon's going to be a bit of a problem for the Geminids, but uh, you have got a few moon-free hours on the 14th of December if you get out early in the morning uh, before sunrise. Uh, we have another meteor shower, so the Quadrantids, which is a lesser shower, but occurs ideally placed for the, for the new moon on January the 2nd, so the maximum for the Quadrantids is on uh, the evening of the 3rd of January. So both of those worth getting out for, but the Geminids certainly is, is the best shower we have of the year. So if you want to see shooting stars, go out. There's another one. Go out and um, have a look in the morning of the 14th. So then just finally, it's been mentioned already today, but I wanted to just talk through this. This is James Webb Space Telescope. So this is, I think for as long as I can remember, being, being built or designed or whatever, but it is finally going to get launched, hopefully on the 22nd of December, on an Ariane 5 ECELA rocket. So basically, we're going to put $10 billion of highly precise, beautifully engineered telescope on top of a massive firework, <laughs> light the touch paper, and cross fingers. 
So if you go on Wikipedia, there's quite a nice graph of the um, what are called launch outcomes of, uh, of launches. Uh, this is for Ariane 5 ELA. You can see actually it's dropping down in terms of the number of launches. But the green ones are the successful ones. The yellow ones are the partial one, partially successful, and the red ones are the failures. And, and you'll all remember the very first Ariane 5 failure, which occurred when it basically dropped, I think, the cluster satellites into the Atlantic Ocean just after launch. So this is just after lunchtime, 12.20, on the 22nd of December. Keep your fingers crossed that this thing, the Ariane 5, is going to get that thing up into space. Assuming it does, it's then got a bit of a journey. So it's going to L2. So that's the second Lagrangian point. So that's about one and a half million kilometers away from the Earth, away from the Sun. It's got an incredibly complex sequence of unfolding and uh, putting stuff together as it heads out there. Um, which, so if it survived, well, I shouldn't say this, it will survive the Ariane launch. Once it gets into space, it's, it's still, not, still not there yet. It's got to unfurl things. It's got loads of things to do. Unfurl its sunshade, unfurl the entire optical system, calibrate it, make it all work. But we should be able to watch this because it's heading out um, to the Lagrange point. And at the moment, the Lagrange point is opposite the sun in the sky, pretty much. So if you go to JPL Horizons on the web, and you ask it to tell you where James Webb Space Telescope is, it will actually give you an ephemeris, a list of positions to go and have a look. And for all the period when it's heading out to L2 after launch, so that's from the 22nd of December through to early January, it's moving through Orion and Monoceros at about zero degrees declination. And it ought to be reasonably bright. So it ought to be something that amateurs can pick up on telescopes. So it's your opportunity to actually maybe get some images of James Webb as it heads out to L2. But keep your fingers crossed that Ariane 5 works and that it doesn't do what this rocket did. <laughs> so this, this is a, a great uh, rocket. This is a, a private launch company called Aurora who've got a rocket with an absolutely stunningly good guidance system that it can withstand the loss of one of its engines and basically go and plough a furrow um, off the launch pad for about 20 seconds before it finally burnt off enough fuel to head up into the sky. So Ariane 5 has a much, much better launch record than that. It is not going to fail. Ariane 5 will work. JWST will get up there. All the unfurling will work as well. When it gets to L2, everything will be perfect and we'll get some stunning images from it. But I still think we need to repair Hubble. We need to maintain Hubble and keep it going. So write to Elon Musk and get him to agree to funding a Hubble repair mission that can go up there and sort out Hubble. Anyway, happy Christmas, everyone. I know it's still December the 4th. We've still got quite a bit of 2021 to go. But I hope you've enjoyed the meeting. I've certainly enjoyed having a, an audience to talk to rather than a computer screen. So safe journeys home, everyone. And uh, see you at next meeting. Would anybody like to ask Nick anything? Yeah, right. No. Well, uh, I mean, Nick has done a very difficult job. It's very difficult to cover everything that's in the sky in one talk and be an expert on absolutely everything, but Nick does that. So thank you very much, Nick. Uh, finally, I'd also very much like to thank the staff at our venue, the Royal Society of Medicine in Wimpole Street. They've done an excellent job catering for us. Thank you very much to the technician in his box for uh, masterminding the feed to YouTube, which I've been looking at intermittently, and it's quite a skill to do that and to get it right. So that's been going very well. Thank you very much to him. I'd also particularly like to thank our meeting secretary, Hazel College. She isn't here today, but she may be watching at home, and she's done a huge amount of work in preparing for this meeting. So could we give a round of applause for Hazel?
So our next meeting will be at uh, the Camden Irish Centre, 22nd of January, uh, and I hope to see many of you there. Thank you all for coming. <laughs>